so I would like to welcome everyone to this uh, day event, uh, which is dedicated obviously to the UpSkills project, uh, and during which we're going to be talking about uh, using educational games. Obviously, we're going to be presenting the project to you, and then we're going to be zooming in on how to use uh, educational games uh, in uh, higher education curricula. Uh, I'm afraid that we uh, we've had a cancellation by the Honorary Chris Bonnet, uh, who's the Parliamentary Secretary. He had kindly agreed to open this uh, event, but unfortunately there were some unforeseen circumstances that prevented him from being here with us. Uh, so I think we can just start uh, with... Uh, um, I, I trust you all have the link to the, to the timetable, so you know when the breaks are, but we will keep you posted too. Uh, I think we can start off with a short introduction of the project uh, so that uh, you understand exactly what, what we've been doing and uh, what this is about. Uh, so UpSkills is an Erasmus Plus uh, strategic partnership and it's made up of a consortium of eight partners. Uh, University of Malta is acting as coordinator to the team, but uh, in equal standing there are uh, uh, seven other uh, entities, uh, I mean six universities and, and one research uh, infrastructure entity. Uh, the University of Belgrade, the University of Bologna, uh, Clarin, uh, Eric, uh, University of Graz and University of Rijeka were all funded by the European Union and then uh, getting their own funding through the Movetia um, um, route. Uh, our two Swiss partners, University of Geneva and University of Zurich, uh, are also partners in this uh, project. Uh, I would like to start off by telling you what the main name of the project is and, and, and basically uh, what, the reason why we kicked started this uh, whole enterprise uh, was that we wanted, we had identified, it's in their own rights, that there is a mismatch between the skills that students get in when they study linguistics or language related disciplines, translation, interpreting and, and the lot, uh, and the ones that are needed uh, in the industrial sector that has to do with language, which we all know now is currently booming uh, with the advent of, of OpenAI and, and Google and Facebook and all these uh, big conglomerates. So the rationale is that there is a need, and actually we, we have confirmed this through a needs analysis that will be presented to you uh, quite soon, uh, that there is a need for uh, students or graduates who have a language-related degree or a linguistics degree uh, in both research jobs in academia, but also uh, independent research jobs in the uh, industrial sector and industry jobs too. Um, however, we've, uh, we've figured out uh, through uh, a detailed needs analysis that uh, is going to be presented to you uh, in a couple of uh, sessions from this one, uh, that these graduates usually sometimes lack um, critical thinking and problem solving skills, not in general, but uh, outside what, what can be called their comfort zone. So usually students are specialized to the dissertations, to their own research uh, in very specific areas of language analysis. Um, but uh, it, it has been noted that they don't really transfer um, all of these cap capability and abilities to other areas that are not their areas of specialization. Um, and then uh, this actually um, extends to the knowledge of how um, research is designed and data is analyzed, again, outside of the comfort zone. So you might have someone who's really, really good working with speech and annotating, I don't know, phonetically and whatnot, but then they would feel out of bounds when they are dealing with, I don't know, a, you know, a, a, a syntactic transcription a task or whatever have you. And then another uh, issue that we've identified is that um, graduates of, of these courses are usually of a humanistic background, unless, of course, they're doing an NLP course or something that's specialized in technical knowledge. Uh, 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 and they also lack uh, skills relating to project management. And uh, the vast majority of, of um, jobs that exist uh, in the job market today that relate to language has to do with completing projects and whatnot. So the natural progression is for someone to start off uh, by analyzing language and then eventually become uh, a manager. 
uh, in their um, own right. And, and finally, that there is also a gap, especially when we're talking about humanities degrees in the digital skills that uh, a graduate can uh, bring, uh, can get on board. Uh, we're not talking that we want to create a, a whole army of programmers out there, but some basic understanding and appreciation of digital methods, I think is necessary nowadays if somebody wants to uh, get a job, especially outside academia. So uh, the way in which we're trying to tackle this uh, is we've come up with a four-pronged approach. Uh, approach. Uh, the, our, our basic weapon of choice is the creation of uh, a learning material that is both modular in nature in the sense that people can use it not as a full block, but as tiny bits of, of information that they can include in their own learning. Um, and also this includes an element of blended learning and active learning to a certain, to, to a large extent. Uh, in order to, and, and this is the aim of today's um, meeting actually, in order to uh, engage the students even more, we wanted to test out innovative pedagogies and we decided to focus on online educational games. Um, and um, apart from this, we want to promote active learning in the sense that uh, students learn through task or research based, um, engaging task or research based learning and learn through uh, doing real world, so through employing real world applications. Um, uh, and then we also wanted to uh, test out the waters about integrating what research is actually being done uh, and what research infrastructures are available out there into our teaching with a special focus on undergraduate teaching, which seems to not be as research oriented as postgraduate study. Uh, in order to do all these things, obviously, you know, these, these aims we've tried to um, put together in terms of, in, into uh, four intellectual outputs. Uh, the first one was the needed analysis. This has been completed since 2021. Um, then, uh, I'm sorry, there shouldn't be this. And we have guidelines on research-based teaching. This is our second intellectual output. Uh, and it's again, completed or very close to completion right now. Uh, we created learning content and we are currently consolidating and adapting it uh, to, uh, to the needs of the project. And today's focus is gonna be educational games for active learning. Uh, that being said, as, you'll, as you've seen already in the program, the first couple of hours of the session has to do with familiarizing yourself with the scope uh, and aims of, uh, of upskills. Um, and then uh, in order to spread the word, uh, you're currently taking place in a multiplier event, but we have planned multiplier events for all intellectual outputs. We've already successfully concluded, and hopefully this will keep up with this tradition, um, a one multiplier event in Bologna, another one in Graz, uh, in Utrecht. Uh, there have also been two dedicated Swiss events, uh, one in Lugano and the other in Geneva, actually a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and now uh, we're having our final multiplier event in Malta. However, apart from spreading the word, we also want to test out what we did. So I think that the culmination of the project is coming up in July, where we will be hosting a summer school in Serbia, getting uh, students uh, from uh, all the partner institutions uh, in order to test out uh, what we've done and get them to do things uh, with language. Uh, and finally, I'd like to give a brief overview of what we're expecting to do here, because, okay, obviously our main goal as creators of content or games or whatnot would be that you use our materials uh, and since it's open access you know we would like to encourage you to at least consider using them and implement them in your own teaching um, I, I, again these are not self-study materials but students who are motivated enough can have a look through them and i'm pretty sure they can pick up um a couple a, a few things from going over them uh, uh, the, the results or what at the aims of the project more generally are is that we want to prepare our students better for the reality of the job market because yes i mean obviously there are a lot of students who are focused on academic excellence and want to pursue a career in academia or continue doing research uh, for the sake of progressing knowledge but at the same time the reality of, of of life is that they will need to at some point get a job and they have what it takes they need to have what it takes in order to get a job uh, in the uh, language industry uh, we also want to and i think that this is one of the main main um, aims of today's event we, we also want to sensitize academics because this event is 
geared towards you with respect to the skills that employers are actually looking for um, uh, so that at least you know you keep in the background that yes we need to teach a particular set of, of, of knowledge disciplinary knowledge but at the same time we should also try and develop our students transversal skills in, in these domains in x and y domains uh, we also want to raise an awareness among employers and thank to those who joined us um, from the industry as well uh, about the skills and aptitude of graduates and of linguistics and language related degrees there is a tendency uh, in some markets uh, to not specifically seek uh, employees who are specialized in language or linguistics uh, in order to carry out especially in the domain of language technology in order to carry out work uh, that is related to language and uh, at least from what we gathered from our uh, focus interviews with the industry and whatnot, uh, it becomes apparent that, you know, someone with a background in linguistics is much better suited uh, for the role uh, of dealing with language than someone who just has a computer science degree or whatever have you. So we also want to make sure that employers know that, you know, our graduates can also fit this profile. And obviously, uh, moving on to more superficial sort of aim, it's basically we have created this modular learning content uh, and it's freely accessible to everyone. So I would like to invite you to have a look at it. Actually, uh, Yelena, one of our partners who's here today, is going to be talking to you about this uh, learning content uh, very shortly. Uh, and with regards to this and why we would like to motivate you, the way in which we'd like to motivate you to engage in, uh, with our learning content is because we believe that the students would be better off or would learn in, in a more motivated and engaging fashion if they engaged in active learning, uh, which basically means that they engage in learning by doing rather than by listening to the lecture. So uh, this has been a very brief overview of the overall project. I would like to thank you all very much for joining us, uh, especially the on-site people. Uh, and uh, I would like to uh, invite everyone to sign up for a newsletter. You're going to listen to a lot of, in, I think, interesting information about what we've delivered. And I'm pretty sure that you might want to get a look at it. So uh, you can visit our website. The information would be there. Uh, you can sign up for the newsletter because, for example, the games we're presenting, they will be launched uh, at the end of this month. And you can also follow us for updates on Facebook and on Twitter. Those of you on Twitter would be very happy to get you to tweet using the hashtag UpskillsME4 uh, so as to spread the word about what we're trying to do here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stavros. I'm very happy to speak at this Multiplier event. And yes, since uh, since I think you took over, I'm so glad you took over for me the coordination. Uh, I've been focusing mostly on the relationship between industry and higher education. And I'll say a few words more about that, also about where I'm currently, where I currently are, uh, am and, and how that uh, helps me do this. So um, here's a little overview of what I'm going to talk about today. So it will be a little bit of a lessons learned um, uh, talk. Uh, I'll talk about perspectives both from industry and academia. And uh, first, I'll talk about how you can integrate industry-based research into teaching. And then what are the challenges and opportunities for academia? The challenges and opportunities for industry and how we're doing this at upskills and what are the first uh, feedbacks that we got from uh, how we did this in 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 upskills and how we might be able to improve what we've been doing so far so uh, yeah i thought i'd start uh, so staff was already explained but yes i've been mostly working in uh, academia and uh, uh, about uh, three two three two and a half years ago uh, i was uh, in malta i've been there for uh, quite some time uh, working at the institute of um, uh, linguistics and language technology where stavros is now the director uh, and so i've been uh, in this kind of uh, linguistic environments but i since my background is uh, natural language processing i've been both in computer science uh, environments and in linguistics environments uh, so in malta it was mostly a bit more linguistic -y, and now it is very much more computer science uh, environment because I'm now at EDIAP and I'll show you in a few slides what EDIAP is. It's a, it's a research center. Uh, it's uh, an independent not-for-profit research foundation. It was doing AI since uh, 30 years already. So before uh, all this hype and uh, chat GPT, <laughs> before, uh, so when it was still uh, not very, uh, a very cool thing to do. Uh, but now we've grown quite a lot. We are about 170 uh, employees, many people from different nationalities which is a uh, which creates a very vibrant uh, situation which is nice and we have 
PhD students because we're not uh, a teaching, uh, we're not a university, right? So we're a research institute, so we have uh, mostly postgraduate students. Um, we have AI, but multiple facets of AI. So I'm working on AI that's related to language, so NLP, but there are other people doing robotics, and so they would have you know, not much to say about working together with linguists, but I do. Uh, and then we have this, um, we want to also bridge this uh, gap between academia and industry. This is why I also took on the task of linking industry and higher education. Uh, here we do that with a, a, a team of R&D engineers that help us create code that uh, is good enough for, for companies, whereas usually when we do our research or code, that's not good enough for companies. So we have this special R&D uh, engineering team. Um, we have three things that are very important for us at IDEP. So research is the main thing. We're a research institute. We want to do excellent research. So we have many research projects, but we also have training and we have innovation, which is tech technology transfer. So there's a the link to industry. Uh, we do that with, you know, creating startups. We have a, a hackathon that we organize in collaboration with companies. And we have also an industry driven master. So that's an applied master where you, uh, do um, you get trained into AI, uh, but at the same time you're hosted or you're, you're actually employed by a company. So there's a matchmaking process in the beginning, and then you uh, work for this company and you kind of end with a project where you've um, implemented an AI strategy or an AI tool for this particular company. And then we have training. Uh, so some of us give uh, classes at uh, APFL, which is the university here nearby. Uh, we also have a joint development plan with them. Or, yeah, in my case, I'm still affiliated with the University of Malta. And, uh, yeah, you see that there are several other universities that we are affiliated with. So, uh, yeah, I have just one of the research groups. I have just one of the research groups here. We're about over 14 research groups, all in very different areas, as I was saying. But in my case, there is language in my, uh, <laughs> in my, my the title of my group. So, uh, yes, I'm focusing on, on language. Okay, so that was a little introduction of where I come from, so you better understand maybe also uh, the experiences that I share with you that they are maybe a little bit, well, in a way, easier to link industry and, uh, and higher education is a bit easier if you're from a more technical background than if you are maybe from a pure linguistic background, there's not that much uh, of a history. We've, we've had internships for a longer time already. Uh, but I think that there's definitely also a, a lot of space for uh, more pure linguistic uh, subjects to create this link, but I think it, there's still more work to do. So some experiences from my own work. So this is when I was working in Malta. Um, uh, there was there are several ways to start these uh, collaborations. One is um, we had a, a visitor from the Directorate General of Translation who came to Malta. I asked her to give a short presentation because I had a, a, a lecture on multilingual uh, NLP. So that fits really well, I thought. So she tell, she told us like, you know, what she used, what tools she used, what problems she had. And based on what she was explaining, we could actually come up with an assignment for the students uh, that where they could work on some practical tasks, that, that a problem that she had, and they could improve that. Uh, the other thing is uh, at some conference, I was contacted by a company and we started a collaboration. We jointly supervised a student, a master's thesis. And uh, the good thing is this resulted in a patent, which is, of course, really good for this student, also for his CV and everything. You can also have internships as part of the curriculum. So at the Language Technology BC at the University of Malta, we always had this uh, or we had that since I was there. We've always had this compulsory uh, internship unit. Uh, now, that is maybe not something that's traditionally done in linguistics degrees. I'm, I'm not so sure. We are, of course, more technology oriented. And the other thing is doing a matchmaking through a project. And this is what we did uh, for upskills. So, um, yeah, some possible formats. You can do a joint supervision, supervision of a thesis. Uh, you will have one student. You focus on this. But you do have a strong commitment, both from the, uh, from the industry, from the student. And in my experience, you really have quite a task there as, a, as, a, as the academic because you need to make sure that the company doesn't ask too much of your student that is very practical, that they can still do their, their research, right? Uh, so you have to be a bit in the middle and, and safeguarding, uh, you know, the work that actually your student wants to do so that the company doesn't get too demanding on, on what they're doing. And I remember that that was quite a challenge uh, where I had students uh, coming to me like, almost crying like you know they're asking this and this I want to do that how do I solve this so you really have to be there as a kind of mediator 
uh, a student project as part of a course is where you have several students in, in, in a group. Uh, and that's actually a bit easier, I thought, because you, um, you know, it's not such a big commitment and they're just doing something. If it doesn't work out, it's not such a big problem. An internship unit as part of a curriculum is very nice. You make sure that students do this. You make sure that academics are also up to finding uh, a match between companies and students. Of course, it asks quite a, a lot of work from the, the lecturers because you have to have a list of, of, of companies that are willing to give these internships to your students. So you have to always make sure you have good uh, connections with, uh, with industry. It's not, uh, it's not a given, right? So it asks quite some work. Uh, but uh, students were usually quite positive about this. I have, we had very positive returns. They learned a lot from it. So that could be an option. I've only had experiences with this in a, a language technology. So I haven't done this with a, a linguist uh, students uh, so far. And the other thing is a standalone internship. Here uh, you have, for example, just one student. And uh, in this case, it's usually pay, paid because the students don't get ECTS credits for it. And for this, we had quite some experiences, which were, I think, quite positive, but I still need to talk to some of the, the recent uh, students that did this as part of the, um, the upskills project. So what are the perspectives from academia when you talk about collaboration? So I've, uh, this is from my own experience, but also talking to other lecturers. So uh, it does cost a lot of effort to talk to industry. You need to define a task, get students ready, uh, is it worth the effort? That's the question. And, and what will a student get out of it compared to the effort we put into this collaboration? That's one of the questions. Also, will students be willing to do the work without being paid? Or should I try to ask the company to pay the students? And what if they get ECTS for the task? Is that maybe a better solution than them being paid? So there's all these questions that need to be asked. Are companies willing to try and define an interesting task for the student or is their main aim to get the job done and, and they may not care about what the students learn, right? Because they have their, their own uh, objectives and this might not be the same that we have where we want to, to train our students. Uh, but then even if it's the case that the students are kind of, you know, that they, they, they are kind of uh, asked to do tasks that they might not like so much in industry, this may be something they have to face anyway when they go to work. And then maybe it's a good way for them to experience this before so they can try out what it takes to go against that and say, hey, but I want to do something interesting. So be, during their studies, instead of after their studies, when they're uh, linked with a contract and it's maybe much harder to negotiate here, we can also help negotiating, right? So maybe it's actually a good learning experience also to see what how companies work and, and what they, they want from us. And then, of course, how do we get in touch with industry? Uh, in my case, I, I've had been to conferences where there were a lot of industry representatives. They come and talk to you and you, you, you get these connections. But what if you are, I don't know how that is in linguistic conferences. I don't know. I guess there is not an industry representative at every conference. So how do you, how do, you do that? Uh, opportunities academia sees that also preparing students for the job market mentioned this experience in their CVs might help them get a job interesting for students and lecturers to work with real data and do something that's actually being used in real life a lot of students find that very rewarding I noticed uh, and we're creating links with industry which is good for potential collaborations in the future for example joint research projects then, but industry also sees challenges because you might think, ah, they go just, just getting this work done for free. But for them, it also costs a lot of resources to describe a task, prepare the data, get students ready. And also, is it worth the effort? And uh, how many hours of work will a student dedicate for the effort that the industry partners put into this? Uh, also, timing. They need a particular task done at a particular time. And academia is bound to certain schedules according to uh, yeah, their academic uh, year. And timing can be challenging. So they need to find a task that is not too urgent, but only nice to have. They can't really go for the thing that they really need because they cannot be certain that we do it. Uh, can we remain in the same course with the same lecture in subsequent years? Then we can, uh, you know, then the work isn't lost. Uh, that would be nice. And students will need to work on our data and sometimes using our technology. This may raise issues of disclosure. They may need to sign an NDA. So there's also these issues, right? As soon as companies share something, they're also uh, a bit afraid that the, this information might go public. The opportunities they see is also that they get that done that they might not have the time to do themselves. We might be able to have several students to do the same task in order to get some inter-annotator agreement. For example, if you do a paraphrasing task, 
uh, we might get expertise on a certain topic via the students and the lecturer. Of course, this is also very interesting for them. Uh, we might be able to find new recruits among the students and they might be the creation of links between academia and industry is also good for them for joint research projects and also to get our expertise. So, yeah, so this, these were a bit of the, the, the things that I, when I talk to people, uh, both from industry and academia, what they thought were the good sides and the bad sides of doing this joint uh, collaborations. Um, now, based on that, we've thought about what to do um, in upskills. So we have an advisory board that is composed of six members from industry. So that's nice. So this link we have. So we explain to them what are the aims of the project and we ask them for possible projects. Um, we explain, of course, the type of students we have, their background, the amount of work they can do. And they gave us potential projects. And out of those, we presented those projects in one of the upskills meetings and asked lecturers for their interest in these tasks. So that, as a result of that, we had three projects that were selected. And we set up meetings between lecturers that were interested and the industry partners. So what kind of projects uh, came out of that? So one is uh, for uh, students from for, that are studying Maltese at University of Malta. And they are uh, were matched up with a, a spin-off company from the University of Antwerp that does annotation of hate speech for Maltese. The other thing was for students from translation and technology uh, curriculum in uh, Unibo, uh, University of Bologna. And they were matched up with a machine translation company in Zurich, and they were focusing on machine translation evaluation. And the last thing was for students from the Institute of Slavic Studies in the University of Graz, and they were going to work with a multinational AI automotive company, and they were looking at morphological paradigms for Slavic languages. So we had all these, uh, these three, and then we had to, of course, find the, the right students to fill these uh, these positions and luckily for the first one we found a multi student and this ended up to be an extracurriculum um, internship where the student was paid in case of uni bologna we also found a student and uh, I, I think this was part of the curriculum but i'm i'm not 100 percent sure uh, and uh, i've heard also uh, already from the student that it was a positive experience and uh, they went also to zurich they were invited there and shown around so there was a really nice uh, collaboration and, and vibe going on there as far as I, I can I, I could see from the initial uh, feedback I got. Unfortunately, so and maybe I go to the next slide, did all of this go well? So yes, two out of three projects succeeded in bringing student and company together. Uh, they were concluded in the last few months and we're currently gathering feedback from students and companies asking them for, yeah, how, how did it go so that I can write this all up in a report so we can do it better and that other people can also learn from our experiences. But uh, one out of the three projects, the one that was meant for University of Graz, did not find any students interested. That was really a pity because uh, this uh, company also spent a lot of time, actually gave us three possible uh, projects to work on. And then uh, cho we chose one, they completely uh, prepared it. And, and then uh, it, it happened that none of the students in Graz uh, chose the unit where this uh, was actually offered. So we're trying to gather feedback on why that is the case. Why did the students not choose this? And um, it, it's hard, of course, because there's no, you have to talk to people that didn't choose it. So it's, uh, it, we have to go through uh, like indirectly uh, trying to get this feedback. But it is an important feedback because we always think students in linguistics need to get this experience with industry. It will help them for their careers. But it might also be that these students actually don't want to think about this at this very moment. And they just want to do their studies and they're just happy to do what they enjoy. And they don't worry so much about the industry uh, effect. It could also be that maybe the topic wasn't really something that interests them. Uh, we thought that morphology would be interesting for linguistic students, but it seems that they're more in, into literature and um, policies and all these things. So maybe we should have chosen a different topic. So uh, yeah, that, there we really need to think of how we could have done this better. Should we have first thought about the type of students, the things they like, and then couple them with a, with a company instead of the other way around, finding a company that uh, matches with one of, of the type of students that we have. I think there we maybe gave a little bit too much, put a focus too much on what the company wanted, and maybe we should have gone the other way. But it's, it, it definitely is a challenge. Um, yeah, one thing I wanted to say, because this is the multiplier event also for um, for games, uh, we've also tried to 
get this feeling of um, uh, this experience for students to be part of, a, of, an, of an industrial uh, setup in the game. You'll see that later on with Stavros, where we created some videos where we pretended that we were in an industrial uh, situation where there was a, a company representative who needed some advice. And then the student is in this uh, kind of virtual, like this Zoom meeting, and then is asked to give an answer to the, to the, the, the industry representative testing their knowledge uh, to give them this feeling of, of being in a company. How does it go and what kind of uh, uh, knowledge would you need and, and can you get actually from our learning content? So I would like to, to end this presentation with uh, asking you for your experiences and your feedback. Um, you probably have some interesting experiences, both if you're a student, if you're from industry, if you are a lecturer, uh, let me know, especially uh, the people with a, a really linguistics uh, background or, or language background. Uh, I'd like to know how it is for you. I know how it, how it can work for me with, uh, with half linguistics, half technology background, but how does it work? Uh, in, in, in linguistic or language subjects, I'm, I'm not so sure. So please drop me an email. Also, students do that because I would like to know how you think an internship, if you're doing a, a linguistics or, or some language studies, what kind of internship and what kind of topics would you like to work on? What do you see? Do you see any way that this is important? And, uh, uh, and if so, what kind of shape do you think this could take? Uh, so yes, there will be a report on this task in the Upskills project, which you can find at some point when it's uh, been uh, when it's finished finalized on the on the website. In this talk, I'll be presenting the needs analysis that uh, Stavros was mentioning before, which has already been presented at several uh, Upskills multiplier events. But there's news about it because we've just created. Uh, a website that is meant to disseminate further the the results of the of the needs analysis and that's going to be the main uh, focus of my talk okay now so um a brief recap on io1 the needs analysis intellectual output number one um it was like stavros was saying in this introduction um the aim there was to explore the what is there uh, in uh, university curricula um in terms of the skills that we thought when uh when we were writing the project that would be needed in today's market. So research skills, data analysis skills, data handling skills, and we wanted to see whether they are there, whether they are offered at university level. And also, um, we wanted to look at the market perspective. So what kind of jobs are there for students in uh, degrees uh, pertaining to languages, translation, and linguistics? So uh, how did we do this? Um, we started with the educational perspectives uh, and the university perspective. So we looked at the existing literature on the uh, approaches to delivering skills that are needed. So we looked at academic papers, we looked at language industry service, uh, like the language uh, service provider survey, um, which is a an association of translators mainly, um, and institutional reports or position papers, which have to do not so much with uh, education of, uh, or specifically on the education of um, students in translation, languages, linguistics, but on education in general. And one of, the, of these was the UNESCO, um, UNESCO report. We looked at existing curricula, scanning the lists of courses that are offered for the kind of skills and competencies that we thought uh, would, be, would be relevant. We looked at 122 of them, BA and MA degrees in languages and linguistics. And then we turned to the market. So we looked at whether um, these jobs that we had in mind, so not so much traditional jobs like translator or a lecturer was, were there because we know that they are there, but these jobs were there is a need for a mixture of technological competencies, research skills, and uh, a background in languages, linguistics, or translation. So we started with an analysis of a corpus of job advertisements by nearly 200 companies, uh, by nearly 110 companies, and we looked at 200 job ads. We then use this as input for an online questionnaire involving uh, 70 uh, companies. So we, we ask companies whether the, the findings that we gathered from the, from the corpus were, did actually match the perception of the companies. 
And then we went even more in depth through focus groups. So we asked uh, a selected number of uh, job market stakeholders to comment on the results of the survey so that we would be sure that what we were seeing actually matched uh, the requirements of the, of the job market. Now, uh, some of the insights, this is a, a very long report and every stage has an associated report. So I'm just going to give you like a hint uh, of, the, of the main insights, but I'll then provide the link to the full, uh, to the full report. Now, uh, first thing, the research skills, data acquisition skills, and data handling skills that we thought were relevant are definitely underrepresented in curricular descriptions. This does not necessarily mean that they are not there. We know that research skills are taught at university level in BA and MA degrees. They simply do not show clearly in the descriptions of the, or on the website. So that's something we might consider uh, working on if we find out, like we found out, that research skills are indeed relevant even for the industry. Um, there is a global societal need, so not just for translators or for linguists, uh, for more technological and transversal skills. And here, critical thinking really um, came up as one of the most required uh, skills for people in general, not just language students. Um, when we look at the perspective of companies, um, Problem solving, communication skills, and independence are the most needed skills. So not so much technological skills, but really independence, being able to communicate results or to solve, to solve problems. And these are also the areas that are in need of improvement. And to end on a positive note on the, on the insights from the needs analysis, there is a large demand in the industry for graduates uh, in languages and linguistics, and it's increasing. The demand is increasing in the sense that there are twists to the old occupation. The recent uh, changes have introduced changes in the way professions are, um, in the way people work, even traditional jobs like translator, uh, but there are also entirely new options, so really new jobs. Now, to sum up the insights from this needs analysis, we came up with, a, with what we call a modular profile for uh, graduates in related disciplines, which brings together the set of required knowledge, skills, and competencies that emerged as crucial, uh, but also the typical tasks associated with emerging jobs. Now, this, is not, this does not correspond to a single job. It's like a, a modular thing where you can pick different competencies that are there in the job market, but simply maybe in different combinations with respect to what we are presenting here. Um, the profile itself is split into a fourth sub-profiles, um, so language data analyst, language data scientist, language data manager, and language project manager. The first two have to do with language analysis and are distinguished by a level of seniority mainly. So the language data analyst analyzes data, the language data scientist is also involved in designing research about language data. The latter uh, two profiles have to do with managing more than analyzing data. Uh, the first one focuses on um, data, so curating, maintaining data, and the latter with actually managing language projects, language data uh, related projects. Here is the link to the full uh, IO1 report, uh, which is again a paper. But the, the novelty here is that we thought that we actually needed to disseminate this further, that, well, more than just through a report. So we created an interactive version of this profile. Uh, and this is uh, the link. You're more than welcome to uh, visit it if you, if you feel like. Uh, the, the, the link is not going to be the same. So it's still a development version. We've not released like the final version yet, but then um, it's already usable. Now, what's the, what's the aim of this um, website? Well, again, it's to raise awareness about the fact that uh, new positions have emerged for uh, students in languages and linguistics, um, and to make students aware that these jobs exist and what are the uh, competencies that are needed if they want to access these um, these jobs. But also, it's also intended for lecturers in the sense that it's a tool that they can use to help students realize that these uh, professions exist and that these competencies are in fact needed. Uh, one of the main um, 
one of the main difficulties we faced when talking about these jobs to students is that basically they don't believe us. They don't believe that such a job as the language data analyst exists. So this is a way to help them, you know, get in that path if that's what they feel like. So uh, it contains a list. This website contains a list and a description of the um, skills and competencies needed, a description of the profiles and associated tasks, and a survey, which is really the heart of it. Like Stavros was saying, one of the approaches of artist skills is that of gamifying the experience, making content more engaging, and we thought that a survey would be a good way to help students get into this uh, perspective. Now, uh, I'll just show you a bit uh, of the websites and the different uh, sections of the, of the, of the website. Now, starting with the required uh, skills, you see this is uh, what we call um, knowledge clusters. So they are clusters of um, competencies or skills that are needed. Some of these are in a way transversal, so they are required by all jobs like disciplinary competence, uh, transversal competencies or intercultural competencies. And you see that next to each, let's say, label, there is a short description of the, um, of the associated, um, what it means. To make this more concrete, we also have like this read more button, which takes users to a, a longer uh, description of the, of the skills, which also makes examples. Again, the purpose here is that of um, making examples, making things concrete for students and lecturers to even who are not necessarily aware with, for example, technical skills, what it means to acquire uh, technical skills. So, for example, for technical skills, uh, we mention CAT tools, computer assisted translation tools, or we mention machine translation engines, uh, engines, uh, chat GPT. So, uh, to actually give an idea of what you are required to know. And, and data oriented, so there's a list of all, of all the competencies and the associated, um, the associated tasks. Now, when it comes to the professional sub profiles, there are different ways to get there. The first one is just by clicking from the homepage to the full description of the, of the profile, but we'll see that there's also another access point to these. So if you click on, I'm looking here, well, I don't see it, but it should be the language data analyst, yes. Um, the, you, we start with a short description of what a language data analyst does. So uh, work on operative tasks as a language data collection, transcription or annotation, language data exploration or analysis, and so forth. Then again, in the spirit of making things concrete, we make examples of what a language data analyst does. And notice that not all data analysts do all these things at once or in a single job, but again, it's a modular thing. So it's like a label that encompasses different existing jobs. So linguistic data collection, transcription of audio files, linguistic annotation. Remember that these are derived from an analysis of actual the job advertisements from a survey and from a focus group. So we're not coming up with these. They are actually uh, evidence-based. And we present the knowledge, skills, and competencies that are specific to this profile. So we have like this word cloud. And again, the description that I was showing you before, but in this context, we are showing the competencies in decreasing order of importance. So for example, for a language data analyst, data-oriented skills are crucial. They might be less crucial for a language project manager, for example. I'll just show you uh, also the, the language project manager, which is the other type of profile. So the manager profile, not the analyst profile. Uh, and again, it starts with a description. Uh, it goes on with uh, the typical tasks and responsibilities. Notice that we have put disclaimers here and there to make students aware that these are, that we mention a few competencies, but that in fact, things like disciplinary competence, uh, competence in linguistics or in translation is necessary across the board. Okay, so it doesn't appear as one of the required um, knowledge, skills, and competencies, but just because it's needed everywhere. And again, here you see a different word cloud with a different list of um, competencies. Mm. Now, I'll just skip the two further ones to, to get to the survey. Now, you're more than welcome to take the survey if you, if you feel like it. Um, 
it is there on the homepage to, to really engage the student. So it's the second thing that one sees when scrolling down the homepage because we really want that to be the access point for students. So we want them to be engaged through this uh, survey. Uh, I have to say it's not like uh, scientifically proved. So it's not like uh, we tested it or we piloted it. It's mostly, again, a gamified experience of the questions uh, that we thought would um, lead the students to pick what is right for them. So the main purpose of the survey is to uh, let students figure out which of the profiles suit their uh, talents or their preferences best. Um, we have different types of questions. I don't want to spoil it, so I have just a few, <laughs> a few questions. Uh, we start with a, let's say, profiling question with uh, about the background of the of the students, um, and then we have questions that have to do with what students think they are able to do or what they might like doing in their jobs. And one of the main difficulties here is that the, some of these skills, uh, I'm thinking specifically uh, of, uh, for example. Uh, collecting and cataloging language data, which is really a skill that is not, that is rarely taught at university level. So students don't know that these, uh, that these tasks exist. So we had to formulate these in abstract enough ways to let them pick them. Yes, to, or to let them understand what we're talking about, which is not necessarily always the case. And then there's a, a last question, which actually uh, we use to suggest uh, upskills courses to the students. So we have a list of uh, a few courses and we point students to uh, the, the learning contents that we created as part of upskills. Again, based on a number of questions, uh, the student sees a suggested sub profile. So out of the four, the one that matches their preferences uh, best. So again, you see a short description um, with a continue reading, which takes you to the full description of the, of the profile. Because again, we thought that, you know, it's always the same information, but presented in slightly different ways, depending on what the focus is in the specific page. And again, we have pointers, so links to the Moodle courses that the students selected as potentially uh, relevant for them or that we know are relevant for that sub-profile. So this is based both on the, on the profile itself and on the answer to the questions uh, that the students provided. Um, very last thing. Um, we get results. We, we keep track of results from survey participants. Now, these data don't mean anything because we've been testing it over and over and over. So it's basically us and, and a few students that we asked to take uh, the survey. But then when we release this, we will set the counter to zero. So we'll see which of these profiles uh, is selected uh, most often by, by student survey participants. And before concluding, I just have to say that uh, the needs analysis were, was really a consortium level effort. So everybody took part in it. It was a, a great experience really uh, coming up with this needs analysis. But then for the, for the website, uh, I have to give credit um, to people who are not there in the needs analysis, um, Olga and Daniele, who actually were very active in uh, promoting the, in creating the website. Uh, plus of course, Silvia and Maya with whom I collaborated also on the needs analysis that was part Published. Good morning, everybody. Um, as as Stavros said, my claim to fame for my sins is having been the dean of the Faculty of Education here at the University of Malta. And in fact, my biggest worry, to be honest, was when Stavros invited me to hold this this keynote. Was all right. It's a you know it's a multiplayer event. It's on 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 digital games or educational games. Um, how am I going to make my PowerPoint attractive enough, you know, for this type of audience? So <laughs> that was my concern. I must start from there. So yes, um, I'll be I'll be dealing with um, uh, active. So please forgive me. <laughs> so um, I'll be dealing with active based learning in higher education. I'll be taking this from, of course, a pedagogical perspective. That's my expertise. I hope that some of my comments will be useful to you. I'll also be trying to dovetail what I'll be saying into um, the 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 upskills project, of course. Okay, so. Yeah, um, I'll be starting from the perspective of, well, well, quality education. I mean, if we speak about active learning, I think the first thing that we need to keep in mind is something that sometimes we tend to forget, that we are all dealing with a concept which is ultimately, you know, related to quality education. And of course, we also need to see what this means. I'll be doing so very briefly, but 
I mean, just keep in mind that quality education, first and foremost, can exist even without having great resources or great digital tools. Um, of course, this is a, a photo which I've taken from um, the United Nations 2022 um, Sustainable Development Goals Report. Okay, and I mean, uh, it is a context, of course, which is not familiar possibly to most of us, but it does exist. And if you actually look at this photo, besides the fact that there are no resources present at all, I mean, you'd actually see that there are actually no windows, that there are two children peering from outside. And uh, I mean, uh, that's, uh, you know, a reality that we also, I suppose, need to keep in mind when we're speaking about education. Um, um, because as a premise, I mean, active learning is linked to quality education. And one of the tenets of quality education is teacher agency. Uh, so it's not how many resources you have uh, in hand, but of course also the human element, which is an extremely important part in at least what we deal with in terms of uh, pedagogy. And um, we know well that the human element has um, also an important effect also on, on, on outcomes. I mean, just I'm just going to mention one specific thing. I mean, if you take attachment theory, for example, into consideration, um, we are aware that, for example, because this is clearly also documented in, in research, that, for example, children who come to school with, um, for example, poor experiences of attachment at home, um, especially younger children, or who, who find it harder, for example, to develop um, uh, coping skills, do develop them when they have a teacher who is capable of actually addressing these type of um, deficiencies. Okay, so when we speak about quality education, of course, it's not just a matter of it being one of the sustainable goals of the United Nations, okay, or 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 the aspect which um, may be formalized in, in in reports, okay. And it's also the fact that you know we're speaking about entitlement, effectiveness, equity, economy, empowerment. Um, these are just maybe five words which I can isolate, uh, which have been used to define um, by, by a colleague of mine who's very highly reputed internationally, Ronald Sultana, to define actually what we mean by, by, by quality education. But again, um, even if we just had to take the element of economy, okay, I mean, we speak about educational games, um, but, and I will not go, of course, into detail on this, but keep in mind that as academics, most of us are academics, I believe, we do live in an echo chamber, Okay, we have to realize that there is a reality out there where um, people do not have the same access uh, uh, to, for example, certain types of materials that we have. Um, just here in Malta, for example, a 2020 survey on, um, you know, uh, households and their, uh, their, their income gave us a percentage of almost 20% of people who are at risk of poverty. There are 85,000 people here in Malta on a population of more than half a million who are uh, at risk of poverty. Now, I will not go, be going into the definitions of this, but of course, I mean, we, we also need to keep this in mind when we speak about education in general and also about higher education. In the UK, for example, today, they are speaking about um, a notion which is called food insecurity. And one in four households apparently in the UK, um, again, uh, seem to be also at risk uh, in terms of food, so-called food insecurity. So, of course, this is just a premise. Um, it's just a premise, but I, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a specialist in, in, in educational theory, as a pedagogist, I think it's, it's worth doing even in this, in this scenario, okay? So, um, let's go to upskills now, okay? And, of course, active learning. Now, this is the second difficulty I had when Stavros told me to present, uh, you know, give a, give a keynote on active learning. I mean, active learning, of course, is a little bit of an umbrella term. Today, we tend to put everything into active learning and everything which has to deal, um, you know, or deals with education somehow falls into active learning. It's become, you know, sometimes a bit of a platitude. I mean, sometimes even the word sustainability has become a bit of a platitude. I mean, uh, I'm, I mean, I mean, I'm not sure whether I am sustainable anymore or whether, you know, after 27 years of marriage, I know that my wife thinks that I'm pretty unsustainable if it comes to that. So, uh, so you know, everything can be boiled down in terms of sustainability. Uh, we, sp we hear about it so much that it, it loses its cutting edge. Uh, unfortunately, when we speak about active learning in pedagogy, it does have this problem, okay? That's why, you know, really so much fits into active learning. And again, um, uh, it's not easy to find a, a definition of, of, of active learning in, in, in many ways, okay? I mean, uh, here, of course, um, I, I've narrowed it down again um, 
to one specific aspect, um, which I've taken from a recent paper by, by Stenalt and, and Lassessen, um, uh, taking also a quote which is related also to the psychological background. And again, as much as, of course, there is teacher agency, I spoke, I, I mentioned teacher agency when I spoke about the importance of quality education. In active learning, there is, of course, student agency too. So these are terms which, which um, also, uh, you know, re relate to this uh, in many ways. Um, so uh, if I were to now, uh, if I were to narrow down a little bit also what at least I, um, you know, would like to uh, address in terms of active learning on this occasion, um, after having asked uh, Chad GPT what, what he thinks, but he, he didn't really get me particularly far. Um, you know, one of the maybe aspects which I, I found which is particularly convincing was actually not the definition of active learning itself, but was found in a, in a report uh, which I had been reading uh, recently, which was also headed by Linda Darling Hammond. You might not have heard of her, but she's one of the leading pedagogists in the, in the US, where, of course, she spoke about careful scaffolding, about rich and engaging authentic tasks, about, of course, active inquiry, but also about explicit instruction. This is the part I liked most. Okay, of course, you're all familiar with these. I'm telling you nothing new. Okay, but uh, the fact that, you know, sometimes active learning speaks about student agency. So it's definitely an approach which, of course, is learner centered, which shifts the onus onto the student, especially in higher education. This is the case. But of course, let's not forget the fact that there is also the explicit part in one, in, in one way or another. So explicit instruction has to come into this as well. Um, um, so, um, Coming now specifically to, 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 to upskills, right? Uh, to the upskills project, even to, to dovetail uh, what I'm saying into, into you know, the, the, the main objectives of this multiplier event. Um, I uh, basically, uh, you know, said, let me try and also address a little bit this question. So um, recently, in, a, in a, again, a recent paper by Borto et al, which is a review paper. So Berta et al in this paper have reviewed around um, 60 um, uh, studies which have dealt with active learning. Um, you know, they actually then boil down their review to this question. So it's basically which barriers to student active learning are identified in research on university campus development and technology use in higher education. So I believe this fits in quite neatly with what you are also doing in, in, in upskills. Um, and these are the barriers. Of course, I'm not going to go into all of these, it's pointless, but I'd like to concentrate a little bit on the pedagogical barriers. This is what I'm, I'm basically going to um, move ahead with. So um, when we speak about um, pedagogical uh, barriers, uh, what has been isolated um, in, 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 in the research, uh, is the fact that there is too little innovation, there is too little professional development, possibly too little personalization of learning, and then issues also with assessment practices. So um, these are, so to say, the barriers which generally uh, tend to cause uh, difficulty in order to have effective uh, active learning. Now, I went into the upskills uh, learning content and I tried to break these down. And to be honest, Stavros, I mean, I think you've done a great job. Okay, I don't, I'm not saying this to be... Uh, or at least in some parts of it, you've done a great job. Let me be a little yeah. bit more severe, okay? You, it, it was you plural, it wasn't you. <laughs> okay. So when it comes to, to, to uh, the learning content that you have produced, and which I obviously have seen through the website, I mean, I've been involved quite marginally in this project, so I, I don't have firsthand, you know, knowledge, but when it comes to innovation, and again, I have here just chosen some examples. I mean, um, if I had to take, for example, uh, learning content, which is related to automatic speech recognition and force alignment, or the essence of machine learning for linguists in tech, I mean, they fall in beautifully, with, which was with what uh, was also presented this morning. Uh, I didn't have the opportunity before my presentation to see, for example, what you presented. And uh, I mean, Honestly, I think this is a project where in terms of innovation, in terms of being able also to have certain study units which flank, uh, you know, the normal, if you like, uh, journey, trajectory that uh, students at higher education actually uh, take. I mean, the innovative element is definitely there. And I think that it addresses also one of the barriers uh, related to active learning. Same thing with personalization of learning. Again, I mean, if I had to, um, you know, isolate, uh, again, I, I've chosen these as part, of course, of the learning content of upskills as examples. So please 
they're just examples, doesn't mean that the others are not, okay? I mean, personalization of learning, of course, definitely is one of the main um, foci of the, of the project. It's, it's clearly um, uh, also um, present, for example, in analytical thinking and problem solving, or in, for example, the processing of text and corpora. So in terms of, I think, what uh, we speak about in active learning and in terms of uh, the pedagogical barriers, listed by Bert et al. Uh, and, and the UpSkills project, where innovation and personalization uh, of learning is concerned, I find the project to be extremely strong. That's to me, is, is a fact. And I think it's been confirmed also this morning. In terms of assessment practices, um, then, uh, of course, this becomes a little bit more complex. I mean, one of the issues that we have, um, well, as a university, um, in terms of, of, of assessment practices, and I'm not sure, how, how much UpSkills actually wish, wishes to give priority to this is the fact, of course, that rightly so. I mean, UpSkills has used an outcome-based framework of education for assessment, okay, which is a little bit the type of framework that we use at the University of Malta and which today is the most fashionable, if you like, uh, educational, um, educational framework, which of course is fine, no problem. But we do. We must understand as well when we when we speak about outcomes that they do also have, of course, their limitations. So sometimes I do hope that, for example, even where the learning content is concerned, that sometimes outcomes are also put there as a sort of guide that they do not necessarily then prescribe us too much. I think that's the best way of using outcomes because one of the biggest critiques that there is towards the outcome-based model of education, which of course today we take for granted even locally in our schools is that, of course, outcomes tend to be particularly prescriptive. And when something is particularly prescriptive, it is not necessarily uh, conducive to active learning or to inquiry-based uh, forms of education, okay? So this is, uh, you know, uh, something that I'm sure, let me repeat, that you are aware of, but, I mean, it's important for, uh, uh, you know, people involved also in carrying out the learning content, whether autonomously or through explicit instructions, to be aware of what actually an outcome-based model of education is like, especially where assessment is concerned. And then, of course, there's the aspect which is um, related to professional development. Um, this is again uh, one of the one of the quotes uh, from from Berthe and 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 Atal's paper. Okay, which I'm of course not going to read, but it's here for you to see because in the review, one of the most striking findings is that there's a big difference between the way academics work. Okay, in terms of the way, for example, we carry out our research, but then in the way we actually teach, right? So there is clearly a discrepancy between the fact that many academics are very much experts of their subject. So they're, they're great when it comes to content knowledge, but less so when it comes to, you know, Schulman's old concept of pedagogical context knowledge. That is how knowing how to teach. I mean, we all know that one of the biggest complaints that we get as universities, at the moment, incidentally, we're going to run audit, okay, is, is that, okay, he's great, he, it's obvious that he knows his subject, but bloody hell, he just does not know how to teach it, okay? So, um, you know, uh, it's something that comes across throughout uh, in, in, most, in most student feedback, and this, I think, in, in, the, in this review that has been carried out, comes out quite strikingly and quite clearly. So, of course, even when it comes to upskill in terms of um, the learning content, I think it is important to keep in mind, you know, I mean, how it will be delivered, that there is also a bit of explicit instruction behind it, both if it's going to be, you know, uh, delivered materially or also in terms of the instruction, which are actually then going to lead to the learning content. Unfortunately, I mean, um, we also live in a context. Now, of course, here I'm, 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 I'm speaking more about my context, the local context, maybe a little bit about the Italian context, which I'm very familiar with, um, where, of course, universities have become uh, highly, highly bureaucratic. Okay, I mean, it's literally sometimes a case of you know the tail wagging the dog right? Where it's, you know, sometimes more administrators who, and again, this is undoubtedly in terms of professional development, a barrier to, um, to active learning. Because when something is highly prescriptive, it of course becomes more difficult to actually remember what we are uh, actually all about in terms of our academic um, uh, contribution to university. Um, uh, one final thing, and I'll conclude with it, okay, so just a final reflection, this is basically what I, what I tried to deal with this morning, you know, I took active learning, took some barriers and tried to relate them to, 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 to quality in education, 
is of course the fact now I, I, I wasn't here unfortunately this morning because I had another online meeting for Lonekes presentation, um, which I would have loved to hear. Um, but I was really uh, happy also to, 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 to listen to your presentation and you clearly spoke about transverse skills because of course, um, uh, this is another issue which we, we need to keep in mind. It's of course great to have education and you know learning content which is also directed towards industry. So it's great to have a needs analysis which is also related also to goals of the industry. Uh, of course, we also need to keep in mind that I think one of our main missions today is to uh, you know clearly counteract uh, an excessively technocratic view of education. I mean, we, you spoke about transverse skills. Because, I mean, um, this is absolutely uh, what is necessary in our role. I think it's a huge challenge. And I think as an educator, one of the things that it sounds, again, like maybe a platitude, but one of the things that, of course, we often speak about is that uh, even in higher education, we, we sometimes tend to prepare even, um, of course, a needs analysis is necessary. I'm not saying that it's not. But of course, when you do a needs analysis, you have a needs analysis for the type of industry or the type of work placements that generally you see or you envisage today. But of course, these will probably not be there, you know, this better than me in not even maybe five years time, but even less than that. Okay, but of course, transverse skills, or let's call them soft skills, do remain. And this is, I think, again, one of the huge challenges that uh, higher education is facing. Um, but um, I wish to conclude also by, um, you know, uh, underlining the fact that the learning content of, 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 of upskills is especially innovative is highly personalized towards learning, clearly is geared towards uh, active learning and to breaking down the pedagogical barriers which can impede this. So, um, you know, uh, I think that the, the, the promise is there, definitely. Okay, thank you for listening. So essentially I'm um, presenting the second intellectual output of this project, which is uh, called integrating research and research infrastructures into teachings so in terms of what Sander was was saying this is happening essentially within the echo chamber or the the ivory tower of the university but we actually find that there there are also a lot of missed chances at uh, interactions which again have to do with again what Sander described as uh, the lack of interaction between research and teaching that are ongoing at the university so what we find structurally is that at the level like of, 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 of individuals, you have the teacher's mindset and you have the researcher's mindset and these don't interact and don't talk to, to each other. And uh, one of the purposes of this intellectual output is actually to make these things talk to each other. So these, these two mindsets that, are, that, that exist at the level of, uh, of individual uh, lecturers slash uh, researchers. Okay, how do I move? Yeah, I move. Uh, I will essentially uh, present, since this intellectual output is basically uh, done, I will present the um, two out of three uh, deliverables of the uh, intellectual output. So I'll present the guidelines and best practices for research-based teaching. And then, and this is, I, I should have used we before, before, because this is actually a presentation together with, uh, with Juliana. So Juliana in the second part will present uh, the guidelines for integrating research uh, infrastructures into uh, teaching. So essentially, uh, the um, again, the rationale behind this also has to do with what Adriano was talking about, uh, where we identified research skills as, uh, as something that the industry is asking for uh, from from our graduates. And essentially, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's clearly a transversal skill, but also it's a skill that becomes relevant when you realize, and we realize that this is some point, our, our um, um, needs analysis was done basically talking to, to industry, but then we realized, well, universities employ people, of course, uh, as well, of course. And it's not self-evident that uh, you want to hire your own graduates. <laughs> you sometimes You sometimes find yourself in a position where you're in, in, on a committee and you're selecting a good uh, candidate for a postdoc or whatever, and the candidates who have your degrees actually do not have the research skills that you need for the research projects that are ongoing at the same university. So this again, uh, a, a good reason to, to connect the ongoing research and ongoing teaching. So what, you, what is, and, and we see basically uh, research-based teaching as the way to connect the ongoing research and, and, and ongoing teaching. What, you, what, what is research-based teaching? Is the kind of teaching where the students it finds themselves students find themselves in in uh, the most researcher like 
role possible. So there, there is basically the student as a participant as, as opposed to audience, but there's also uh, the student as um, participating, not really in like just viewing the results of research, but really in the process of research. So this is th th this kind of, of, of uh, uh, teaching. It was basically the model that we, we have been trying to, to uh, employ in this and deploy in this um, intellectual output. So again, now this is right. This is this is where I need to restructure because we, we kind of established that this is not something that just happens naturally, just because the same people happen to teach and to, to do research. And I can just add to basically what, what Sandra was telling us. I can add um, this reference. Uh, so Fisser Van Fein in a in a dissertation basically did exactly research into into these mindsets. And what she, what she finds is, I'm just quoting academics conception of, uh, research, of the research teaching nexus to this connection are related to their conceptions of teaching and not to their conceptions of uh, research or of knowledge. So what that means is basically when you need to teach a course on something research related, you still employ your research. Like by default, you would report, you, you would employ your, your teacher's brain. You would think, you know, what kind of units am I gonna, what, what, what chapters am, am I gonna let them read and what questions I'm gonna ask, but not really your researcher mindset and this is so uh, apparently this kind of interaction is not something that happens by by, by itself this this nexus doesn't uh, develop by itself uh, uh, and or, or it doesn't it doesn't by itself become uh, something that is uh, more related to our conceptions of research and, and knowledge and what we try to do is essentially again targeting individual individual teachers uh, uh, to develop these guidelines which can make individual teachers able or, or help individual teachers to develop the kind of courses where they can really teach about their research where they can really teach about the skills that they they employ every day when they do research but which they don't like naturally divide with their with their students uh, so in the guidelines um which are available in different uh, forms, some, some forms more available than others. Uh, we uh, offer instructions for choosing and developing uh, a course subject for a research-based teaching course, a uh, list of research-related topics, again, learning out outcomes in accordance with just the general principles of uh, upskills, uh, making instructions for students. So, so uh, we realize it's really important how we interact and, and like not when switching to this uh, teacher's mindset, not uh, also becoming totally incomprehensible to students, because that's something that usually happens when people try to, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to teach to my students, I'm going to talk to my students like they're researchers, and then suddenly they don't understand the word you're saying, because you're <laughs> talking from a totally different persona in a way, uh, uh, when you end up in this, in this uh, uh, setup. So, so basically, uh, we are, we are, again, giving some explicit instruction on how to do this, organizing and super, supervising the work within uh, uh, this course, and also uh, evaluation and um, grading. And then we taught, so we have taught uh, um, until now and within uh, this intellectual output 16 uh, courses. So we are just offering course descriptions, you know, from acquisition of uh, English as a second language to uh, syntax of the DP or the verbal normalizations in West South Slavic all kinds of or, or automatic speech recognition. Um, so just briefly about some lessons that we uh, learned. Um, essentially, uh, one, so, so like, like if, you know, if I had to give like three, three important tips to teachers who are considering research-based teaching. So um, we found it really beneficial to focus on the instructors, on, uh, instructors ongoing research. So really teaching on something that you are excited about at the moment, that you're doing research on uh, at the moment, because that's the easiest thing to reflect on really deeply and to make it into a, um, to, to, to like identify the skills that you want to transfer to your, to your students. Then allowing uh, plenty of time for transferable skills that can easily be overlooked by experienced researchers. What I mean by that is you suddenly you start talking to students about your research and you suddenly realize so many things I'm taking for granted. They don't know. I need to dedicate time to that. So that's happening a lot in, in this. It's especially the first course for most people, extremely frustrating. You suddenly need like 80% more time than you originally planned because, uh, or 800, uh, because you, you, because things keep popping up that you take for granted 
uh, and the students have no idea what you're talking about. And then uh, organizing students uh, students work around the real life like research report. So this is hopefully a bit addressing the the, the issue of um, also of um, evaluation of, of the students' work. So basically, the idea in all all of these courses was, was basically that the students are eventually producing something that is a research report that is maximally similar to a research report in the discipline. Right? Never, it can never be really like you can never like produce something that can be published in a journal in a BA course, but uh, that has like the, the maximal number of features of this kind of report. And uh, then you base your evaluation uh, uh, on that. Okay, so now uh, I'm, I'm uh, basically um, uh, giving the mic literally to, to Juliana. Uh, I'm just showing you, so basically this is the, the PDF uh, version of the research-based uh, teaching guidelines, um, a very long document. And then uh, we are basically, so this is something that you can literally get uh, today if you send me an email. And what is uh, really close to being uh, completed is a website, uh, which is basically kindly getting developed by, by um, Stavros based on, the, on, on our guidelines. Um, so that one is um, supposed to be uh, done soon. So, so it will be. Exactly, exactly. So, so you know, uh, stay tuned. It will it will uh, show up on the on the website. So, so basically, for any questions, and also if you would like the PDF uh, right now, just uh, drop me a line. And now I give the word to Juliana. As an addition to the guidelines in the research based teaching, we have also uh, developed a, a guide about for teachers how to use existing research infrastructures and repositories into their language related courses. Um, uh, I'm Yelena van der Leck uh, from Clarin Eric. For from those of you who don't know what Clarin Eric is, it is a European research infrastructure for language resources and technology. So we are not a university, but we are uh, hosted at the um, uh, University of Utrecht in the Netherlands. Um, so uh, why uh, our motivation to participate in the Upskirts projects was that um, an, an analysis before the project uh, started uh, revealed that the skills and knowledge about uh, data repositories and standards for language data are not explicitly mentioned in the learning outcomes of the uh, analyzed uh, European language and linguistics degrees. And um, the data and services offered by the infrastructures, for example, Clarin, are seldom used in the teaching of language related disciplines. Via a survey, we, we have also learned from teachers um, who are using uh, repositories uh, that they encounter a numerous uh, challenges uh, when using and interacting with these repositories, either for searching data or archiving data at the end of a research project. Uh, technical challenges, limited space um, to store data, little IT support, uh, administrative load and costs, um, issues with intellectual property rights, um, and students need a lot of help with the interpretations of the legal requirements when sharing data, and especially when dealing uh, with sensitive data. Um, protection of data privacy in the case of spoken language, in multilingual uh, recordings, and uh, another challenge that had not only students but also teachers is the, the, the technical skills that they need to interact with uh, research data um, repositories, and also integrated tools and services. So why use infrastructures uh, into teaching? Um, so students learn uh, about the, yeah, you give them the opportunity to learn about the latest research in the field, uh, reuse existing data sets. Um, as you know, it takes a lot of effort uh, uh, and also it is costly to develop uh, corpora, uh, for example. So why not try to use existing data already to answer new research questions? Um, and um, they will also learn to uh, use the tools and services uh, to process and analyze big digital collections that are available out there in, uh, with, with an open, uh, open, uh, in open science. And also identify ethical and legal issues in language data collections and sharing, um, teach them how to develop a research data management plan, which is um, requested uh, nowadays by the European um, Union and also Horizon 2020 projects. Of course, these types of, of skills are mainly taught at the PhD level, but we have learned uh, from 
from the interviews that we had with the teachers that uh, basic RDM skills are also useful to teach already at a BA level, MA level, so that the students have the right skills already uh, at the end of the MA and uh, take on um, a, a career in um, a PhD track, for example. And um, they will also learn how to apply the FAIR data principles and also CARE data principles um, during language data collection, management, sharing, and archiving. And of course, the added value of uh, share your research data uh, with other, with your peers, and, and try to build on and uh, develop new research questions. So um, uh, these skills, of course, uh, may also lead to new career paths, uh, such as language data manager, with that, which Adriano uh, emphasized. And uh, we also came another uh, term or profile, uh, emerging profile, the language, the concept of language data steward. So basically, uh, a student who graduates in linguistics and also has very good technical skills uh, can also support researchers, for example, by working in a research data management department to manage their data during data collection and archiving. Uh, and all these skills are, of course, uh, useful also during language data analysis, uh, processing, uh, curation, management, archiving, um, and so on. So how um, teachers, how can you integrate uh, research repositories into, into your teaching? First of all, of course, by identifying the right infrastructures and repositories for language resources and technologies that are relevant for your course. Familiarize yourself with their data, services, tools, and of course, also the level of support they provide to researchers, students, and teachers. Uh, Clarin, for example, has knowledge centers on specific uh, topics uh, in uh, every country, member country. So there is a lot of expertise in the network that can be very useful to you and your students. And then design and integrate specific learning outcomes into your existing course and uh, develop uh, assignments that require students to use language data from repositories. Uh, and, and of course, encourage them to use uh, these repositories for their own research, either at a, right, when writing their MA thesis or um, um, working on a PhD project. Okay, so to help you and or to make your, your work a little bit easier in Upskills project, we uh, have developed specific learning outcomes related to the use of repositories uh, and integrated them into the research based uh, teaching guide that uh, Marco just uh, introduced. And we have also uh, developed a quick guide to Clarin and show how to use the main services and find relevant information. Clarin is a maze, as you may, some of you know, it's very difficult to find relevant information. So I hope that this be the guide and make your work a little bit easier. And I've also, uh, we have also developed a learning content. Um, in, so basically a, a course, uh, Introduction to Language Data Standards and Repositories would come which comes with examples of assignments, learning activities, um, with clear learning outcomes related to user repositories, uh, language data and sharing uh, and archiving. Uh, so you can uh, take a look and uh, pick and choose uh, and try out uh, activities in your course. And in close collaboration with the University of Bologna, we have also created examples of student projects, for example, working with Corpora, and we clearly ask the students to uh, use repositories to collect data, process, analyze, and at the end of the project also archive Corpora in a, in a suitable repository. And um, to add uh, to the student internship topic that Lonica um, um, presented earlier, Although Clarin is not officially part of the industry, but uh, we are research infrastructure, European infrastructure, it's quite big. Um, and our students can learn a lot as well from the, the research community uh, in Clarin. So uh, we had our first two interns uh, this year, and it turns out quite successful. Uh, they both come with, from a translation studies background. Um, they just told me last week, Juliana, uh, I've managed to improve my coding skills. Uh, so it's very confident. Uh, the student became more confident and also uh, got to use, uh, interact with the research infrastructure and learn how to, how to work with Jupyter Notebooks, for example, and GitHub. And then another student um, got um, better insights in terminology management, which is a, a, a skill that she will use in her career as a translator. She would like to become a professional translator, where, of course, terminology management skills are very much appreciated. And last week, she told us that she would also like to continue writing her MA thesis on the same topic and collaborate with, uh, with uh, Francesca Frontini from uh, the Antonio Zampoli Institute uh, 
in um, Pisa. So um, this was uh, one of very nice, uh, this is another outcome of, of, of collaboration, uh, collaborating in upscales. Uh, this is a snapshot of the guide, which will be soon be available. And again, also uh, on the pro on the website as an addendum to um, to the research-based teaching guide. So basically we show how to use the, the Clarin core services to find and reuse data, uh, collect sites uh, accordingly to existing standards and practices in the language and linguistics community and find high quality corpora this corpora usually is, is very well curated, so it's it's very useful to make the students aware of the existence of this corpora. And um, of course, to teach them also how to deposit a, a language resource they develop in a, in a, in a research project. These are the uh, main learning outcomes of, of this course. Um, if you teach the whole course, uh, it's about 60 CTS, but it's very, very modular. So you can just pick and choose whatever you, you need and just integrate uh, in your course, um, of course, for less ECTS. Uh, these are the um, units in, in a nutshell. And um, yes, if you would like to learn more, um, we can share a draft with you. You can pilot the learning content and give feedback. And of course, why not contribute to the guide with new examples of learning activities that again, uh, we can share with the community of teachers. Thank you. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us in this fourth multiplier event. Uh, it's a pleasure to present things towards the end of the project as we are now almost done with our materials and uh, we do hope that uh, you will be using them and finding them useful. Uh, now, as my previous presenters uh, and colleagues mentioned, a lot of the things that I will be talking about have been mentioned before as well, which is, I guess, natural that uh, we have cohesive presentations. Uh, and I do want to start with something that uh, most of here have maybe seen already. Uh, it's a reprise from last year's multiplier event at the University of Graz. So those of you who are um, teaching specialists might have uh, already played around with this picture, but it's a nice way to maybe break the ice as well and uh, tell me what you see if you don't know what you're seeing or what you think you see in this picture. I guess some of you might probably know <laughs> this image and what it's used for. Any guesses both um, in the room and online? I'm going to try and follow the chat. Any guesses? Oh, okay. Well, our, our keynote speaker sees an alien. Wonderful. <laughs> That's good. Good. Oh, I'm glad it's new to you. That's good. It's not an alien. <laughs> Any dinosaur? Okay, we're going. Uh, yeah, we're going closer to Earth, but then also back in time. Any other guesses? Any other attempts? A hand. A hand. Okay. What does it chat? A sheep. Okay, we're getting close, Lana. Okay, very close. Okay, sheep. Yeah. Any other guesses? Okay, we're we're narrowing down. Do you see it now? Yes, it's a cow. It's a cow. It's the head of a cow. So this is the nose. These are the eyes. The bridge of the nose. The ear. The other ear. The body of the cow and then a gate likely in the background. So this is the head of the cow and I see nods in the room and I'm guessing everyone sees the cow now. Now, what is the point of this uh, apart from it being amusing is that that is a metaphor of education because education is supposed change the way you see things. And now when you look at this image and those of you who were in Graz last year who know this image, they cannot not cow and it is incredible for them that other people don't see the cow. So it is a metaphor for what you're supposed to do with education and that's what we try to do with our materials as well. Uh, in a nutshell, we tried to make interactive content which guides the learner to reflect on the task they're given during and after performing it and to change the way they see the world, their selves, their career. And for that, we, of course, try to aim towards some um, skills that lead them more towards creating, evaluating, 
analyzing. And yes, we learned a learning outcome based approach, but we did try uh, in using that approach to as much as we can include that flexibility in the sense that the defined learning outcomes, of course, express a range. So they're not set in stone, but they do have a minimal requirement. And then uh, they also have something which is uh, an optimal and then, of course, the ideal attainment for the students. And what we tried to do as well is to, of course, have an alignment between the learning content and, of course, the assessment. One of the things that we we did find is that often the assessment is not in line with the learning outcomes. So the learning outcomes are nicely set and then we have the content, but then something completely different is assessed. I see nods in the room. So what we try to do is promote this alignment of the three elements of our learning content. And uh, in it, we created uh, several, um, several uh, deliverables that I will present today. So one is the overview of existing material. So the intellectual output that uh, the University of Belgrade was leading, it started with seeing what is already there. Uh, then we had a dedicated training event for all our teachers where we trained them in how to create the learning uh, content in this way so that we make sure that it's pedagogically cohesive in terms of its approach. That's why we're all talking the same things today. Uh, and we also have this training available on our Moodle. So those who would like to create materials in the same way, they can also make use of our training materials. It's in the same Moodle where our um, learning content for students uh, is. Uh, then we developed also as part of this intellectual output some student research tasks so all our learning content blocks also have research tasks that are very practical uh, usually around one to two ECTS tasks that uh, teachers can use as an idea or as a basis to have their students do as independent research tasks and then uh, sort of the main output of uh, this intellectual output are these module blocks of units uh, which are currently in Moodle they are primarily aimed at teachers and trainers they're not meant for self-study, although of course those students who are very enthusiastic and who want to use them on their own, they can use them on their own. Uh, they are modular in the sense that you can of course pick and choose activities. We indicated as much as we can uh, how much time each activity can take uh, and the Moodle is meant as a sort of window shop where you can uh, see the materials and then import them into your own learning management system. Uh, these blocks are from three to six ECTS in total uh, for each topic, and they have these mix and match activities, which you can then use with uh, teaching this topic or with other topics if the activities uh, are in line with, with what you're uh, teaching. Uh, in terms of the topics, uh, these have been, I, I believe, mentioned today, but here they are now again uh, with their uh, final titles, if I'm not mistaken. So we have uh, different uh, topics from analytical thinking and problem solving to something which is a, a general skill that we realized in the needs analysis is very much needed to some more focused ones. We have automatic speech recognition, uh, language data, um, Sanderson repositories, et cetera, et cetera. So these are all the different uh, learning concepts content blocks that you can um, find and where you have a, a variety of activities. You have also a variety of resources, both to teach the theory, but also some practical activities, some tests, uh, et cetera. So um, onto, the, onto the specific deliverables, which you can already browse on the Upskills website. So one thing that uh, we did was go through all the existing materials uh, to make sure we're not uh, creating something that has already been created. Uh, and uh, a lot of these materials also made their way into what we produce. So we tried as much as we can to build on what is already there. And this is a table that will hopefully also be useful to you too. So not only the things we created, but also this nice overview where we tried to sorted in terms of the general topic. We, of course, looked at the topics that are relevant for upskills. Uh, we marked the language, the type of the materials available, and what kind of license the, the material has. And you have direct links uh, on our website, and it's on, in our uh, deliverables. So you can go through all these kinds of different resources. Uh, while doing this, some colleagues mentioned how we don't want to make just another link that no one will use. So this is our effort to try and at least have all the links in one place and 
hopefully have uh, people uh, using them. Uh, so that's one deliverable that you can already browse on our website. Uh, another uh, deliverable, of course, uh, is the Moodle. And the Moodle is also mirrored on our Upskills website. So on the Upskills website, if you look at the deliverables, uh, you can see uh, the list of the different learning blocks. And here you can see um, a brief description of them. And also you have a link where you can already access uh, what is ready to be previewed. Some are still uh, being reviewed or redone. And of course, after the summer school, which was mentioned today, they will all be uh, in a form that we can really showcase them and have people hopefully uh, use them. So you can browse these for now best on our website. Uh, and then uh, I will conclude with uh, just a short uh, promo on why you even want to use this and why you would want to use the upskills materials uh, if all that was said already is not uh, sufficient. Uh, so one is for institutions. Uh, as it was already said before, there is a lot of, and thank you for that, innovation in our materials. So uh, what you can get is bridging a gap with some emerging developments. Uh, of course, it's not easy to adapt uh, curricula as the industry develops. And what we try to do here is as much as we can. Of course, it is a state right now, but we try to also think at what will be there at least in the next decade. We don't know how things will be transformed necessarily, but we tried as much as we can to include what we see as some emerging developments in, in the industries where our students will likely um, find themselves when they go into the professional world. Uh, what is also very convenient in terms of institutions, and a lot of us in the consortium are university teachers, we know that it's very, very tricky uh, to uh, go through the accreditation processes. Uh, and sometimes if you want to have a whole new degree or a whole new course, it takes a lot of time to do that. And by the time you end the accreditation, the development is over. So what you can do here is pick and choose elements. So you don't necessarily have an entire course. You can take smaller chunks, which don't require reaccreditation. Uh, in most countries, there's a certain percentage of the course that you can change without needing reaccreditation. So it's very useful to take a small chunk, which can innovate your course, but you don't necessarily have to go through all the red tape. So that is a benefit for the institutional side. Uh, for the students, uh, a great benefit is, of course, to catch up with groups. Uh, we often have students who come from different backgrounds, uh, uh, both on BA and MA levels, and you have someone changing specializations or coming from a different uh, area, and the, you do want to have them catch up. So you can use these materials to help students catch up. If you realize when you have a group that they have a very different uh, knowledge in some area where you want to advance a bit you can give them individual assignments and help them catch up on their own. Also, when you have situations such as Erasmus exchanges, you can have someone who also can't maybe fit in necessarily with the group, and you can give them these materials to help them, again, integrate with the group and follow the same pace of learning. Uh, of course, for other students as well, you can help them personalize the learning experience. Uh, those of you who teach know, of course, that people have different learning styles. So this is something where you have a variety of activities and you can engage students more by, by telling them you don't have to do just what the whole group does. You can also find here something that suits you better. So you give them more options to help them learn better. And then finally, of course, all these reasons, uh, they, they are for instructors as well, but um, some, some very good reasons are to facilitate a flipped classroom model. So there are a lot of the things here that uh, with little instruction, you can have students do on their own and then use the time you have, the valuable time you have in person, especially after the pandemic, we all know how valuable in-person face-to-face face time is. You can have students do these things at home and then you uh, use the time in the classroom to discuss what they did and uh, use the time for, for that. And of course, reduce your workload. Uh, a lot of things here are pre-prepared. They're also modular. You can work on them and adapt them to your own needs as much as you want, but they have been crafted in a way to provide a good enough basis if you want to expand your teaching in the direction of the topics that we dealt with. I hope that's enough to uh, convince you. Uh, and I'd like to thank you again and give the mic to Stavros. So following these really you know comprehensive uh, outlines and overviews of, of uh, what we've been dealing with in the first three outputs i think it's time we, we now turn to the main uh, star of this event which would be the games i guess right uh, so um as the io leader for this particular uh deliverable deliverable set of deliverables i would like to introduce to you uh what we've been doing and discuss a bit the rationale behind why use educational games and uh 
give you a bit of a like a teaser of, of what's coming up uh, in the afternoon session too. So uh, I, I'd like to start off by the most obvious choice, which is, you know, okay, we have all these different strategies and techniques that we can use in order to teach our audience. And I think that we need to justify why games are the way to go. And apart from obviously having an intrinsic interest in games um, from the get-go uh, with this project, um, the point here is that because we want to engage in active learning, and I think it, it has been mentioned, but in more subtle ways, uh, I will quote someone so that uh, so that this doesn't appear to be, you know, our opinion as well. But it seems that uh, as the structure of a course these days is modular, and that's fine, and that's actually you know well received and whatnot. But it's usually delivered in lumps, which, according to Chatfield, are big, ugly, and rather unpleasant. Uh, and 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 this actually refers to traditional lecturing. So the student sits in a chair. You talk for an hour and they have to understand what you're saying and you know they're not really engaged in that um, uh, so much uh, and uh, one of the problems with this is that also that it presents a, a very limited picture of the progress of the student as they're following the lecture and whatnot uh, so our decision to go with games and a gamified approach is basically to sorry yes so to 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 provide stimulation and motivation that goes beyond just trying just uh, relying on the student to listen to the to the lecture and also uh, because through the use of gaming as we're going to see uh, I think this afternoon you can also um, assess the learner's ability without actually giving them like a test or something like that right I mean if they're doing something they're playing something they're applying the new concepts and you can actually check whether they've understood them well or not. Uh, but the main obvious, you know, driving force be behind focusing on games, at least to my mind, is the motivation in enhancing the student experience and getting them to be a bit more, uh, you know, involved uh, uh, in, in a funner way, uh, if you will. Uh, so uh, the idea of, you know, the idea of including games uh, in our uh, learning content, in our general, uh, uh, um, you know, conception of, of, of how this sort of teaching should take place is that games have a potential of teaching and learning unlike any other medium. We all know that uh, there is a good chance and we'll see that this is a high chance actually that all our students are actually involved in some casual gaming uh, so uh, it's something that's familiar to them uh, and this brings in an element of surprise and an element of you know doing formal instruction in a more fun uh, way uh, gameplay uh, has been shown repeatedly now and I will have a quote from back in the 60s uh, in my other when i'm presenting the game that we develop uh, um, that that it has been established that it enables the both the intellectual and the social growth of the participant over the long term and that it also helps ideas get stuck in the head in the sense that uh, uh, when um, you know when you're playing a game and you learn something new because you learn it in a fun way it's easier to retain this information rather than not uh, game content, overlapping goals, continuous problem solving, social interactions, gaming cultures are all critical aspects of learning through games. Uh, so even though we're not really specifically focusing on the gaming culture per se, uh, the idea here is that when you engage in gaming, you're sort of immersed in a different world and this um, sort of takes away a bit the stress of the learning uh, process and whatnot. And, and also you engage in continuous problem solving and, 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 you know, trying to solve a mystery, a puzzle or whatever have you, without actually realizing that what you're doing is developing your transversal skills at the time. It's a fun way to, to do that. Uh, so I think that the main take home message and why we, we decided to go down this route is that students, uh, basically, uh, by using games, you can get students to remain engaged, to remain excited, to interact, uh, in a fun way to problem solve and learn at the same time. Uh, so hopefully uh, I have convinced you, but uh, if not, I mean there, yeah, okay. But, but if not, I mean, there is also extra research that showcases that games have a very, very central role to play when it comes to interest-driven learning. And I think that I'm connecting interest-driven learning here with active learning in the sense that, you know, 
developing your own interest in the process or whatnot will essentially help you learn a bit more. Uh, and this is actually not just for the benefit of the student, it's also for the benefit of the teacher. Because by through a gamified experience and through role playing, let's say, you know, I'm the manager of the company and now you have to complete this task for me or whatnot, um, you're also understanding a bit more um, the social um, you know, uh, experience that, that your students have. You can give them tips that go beyond the disciplinary boundaries uh, and the knowledge and whatnot. Uh, so they establish new interests that the student can further explore and investigate in their own time uh, in the sense that, and this is something that we've tried to capitalize quite a bit um, in, in, in the main um, upskills game as well, uh, that, you know, you need to give them tasks that are, uh, or gamified tasks, let's say, that, 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 are quite, you know, not, not what they would expect they would get. Like, you know, you're learning about, I don't know, I don't know automatic speech recognition and suddenly you give them a, a video of Star Wars that they need to automatically translate in another language. I mean, they wouldn't have thought that this is an option or a possibility. They inspire students to pursue questions and answers to, uh, uh, and to developing questions while playing. Uh, so apart from appreciating the reality of, um, um, of, of the tasks that they might need to, to face or not. Basically, the reason that, that, that we decided to, you know, to try and gamify our approach as much as possible and learning as much as possible is that we wanted to create an environment that leads to intrinsically motivated engagement, um, both on the side of the student and on the side of the teacher. Uh, so now I'm going to give you a bit of a taxonomy. This is sort of like the, the lit review stuff of this, but I'm going to try to link it to what we actually did uh, for the Upskills project. Uh, there are two types of educational games, and that's what we focused on. Uh, on the one hand, you have commercial or off-the-shelf games, like ready-made solutions that you can already use. Uh, and uh, actually, you know, these days, because there are so many, like... Uh, you know, there are so many resources available online and especially open access resources as well, as we'll see in the bit. Uh, we, um, you know, the, there are many off the shelf games that you can actually use and which are already replete with constructivist teaching structures and whatever have you. So there are games that you can use and which have um, associated guides about what they're meant to do and what not during a class. Teachers obviously need to understand all aspects of the game and overtly tie it to what they're intending the students to do. And I think that this is important because you need to also give students guidance as to what they're supposed to be doing and why they're doing what they're doing. It's not just for the fun of it and just clicking things here and there and whatnot. And of course, there are then custom-made educational games, which allow for specialized learning through adapted contents to match specific learning objectives. And uh, we're going to give you a couple of examples in the afternoon about custom-made educational games. Uh, and we're go I'm going to focus now more on the off-the-shelf games and what kind of resources we've created for lectures uh, in this field. Uh, then when it comes to custom-made educational games, uh, the point here is that the teacher and the game designer, because if you're creating a game, you need to have apparently you know, a, a game designer who can help put things uh, um, in place, collaborate to tie the game to the learning content and connect students with the, the resources that, that, that you need and whatnot. Uh, I've been in both shoes, so you know I can I can offer some uh, tips and experience for that. So, uh, in order to introduce uh, how exactly we so basically on the basis of this dichotomy, we dealt with uh, reviewing, surveying, not reviewing, surveying uh, existing commercial of the self games. So we have a list of recommendations which we're going to talk about um, later on uh, about what kind of games you can actually find and implement in your teaching and what kind of skills they are. Uh, uh, they, they, they help promote. And then we also develop custom made uh, educational games uh, specifically for the purposes of upskills. Uh, uh, before everything, of course, we wanted to get zoom in a bit more on the preferences of our target audience. And that this stage is not just the lecturers, I mean, the basic target audience of gamification or, 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 or learning through gaming are the students themselves. So we, uh, we did um, uh, administer uh, a survey. Uh, we got responses from 215 students uh, within the domains of, of linguistics, trans translation, languages, and, and, and whatnot. Uh, so, okay, take this with a pinch of salt, but I think that it's a big enough sample that can give us some uh, credible data. Uh, I'm giving you a bit of demographic information. The important thing, I think, here 
um, is that our, our, our rates group uh, is basically 18 to 34, which is in line with what you'd expect from undergraduate and postgraduate students. Uh, thankfully, we did attract quite a few uh, undergraduate students, uh, like one quarter, three quarters of our sample are there. And another thing that you know we, we should probably point out is that, especially given the remit of linguistics and language courses, uh, we got a lot more responses from female participants than we got from male. But I guess this is representative of the trend um, in, in, in education in these particular areas. Uh, so with regards to actual preferences of gaming, um, what was revealed to us, and I think that this was a very, very interesting finding, was that most, if not all, I mean, actually, the purple is not really existing a lot. Most of our um, of the people who responded to the to the game playing preferences uh, survey uh, don't really play for long stretches of time, right? So, like, the, there is a preference for games, an overwhelming preference for games that last up to one hour and perhaps uh, you know one to three hours, but they don't want to really like engage in in a game that would take them days to, to complete and whatnot, which, which I think makes sense and which actually gave us a nice perspective so as to keep our games uh, short and sweet to, to as much as possible. Uh, then when it comes to the location of, of playing, we, we see that, you know, most of our uh, respondents actually play at home uh, for the most part, whenever they can or at home during the day or, sorry, during the night. Uh, or on the mobile phone. Uh, and when it comes to, to, to the reason for playing games, I mean, the overwhelmingly people play games, our, our response play games for leisure uh, and as a distraction to kill time and a social activity, which means that basically this is a very important uh, aspect for us. Like we cannot really create a very serious simulation game uh, that, that, that will require a lot of high order thinking. We need to keep things fun and we need to keep things, um, you know, to the point so that we, we get the balance right of them thinking that it's a leisure activity rather than a very labor intensive activity or not. And we're going to talk about this a bit more when we present uh, the upskills games. Um, now, the, the next question that we, we need to answer is what exactly do you teach through games? And I think that this is a very important question because we've talked a lot about disciplinary knowledge, about transversal skills and whatnot. And I think that games can apply to everything. Uh, to a certain extent, but what what the, I think they are most most pertinent uh, on uh, is the the fact that they help develop, or at least they help. I would I would put it they help um, embed disciplinary knowledge within uh, a more transversal skills mindset, right? So the focus of games would be more on uh, on problem solving, on critical thinking, on creating a sense of community or whatever have you, while using your materials, your your disciplinary knowledge and embedding them into the games. Um, and, and basically the way we've approached gaming in this particular case is that um, games can be used to introduce a problem and draw a parallel from the real world to the game world or, or, or whatever have you uh, in order to establish the relation of the game with, with whatever learning it is that you're developing. Uh, and actually what I'm going to be presenting this afternoon is based on, on the idea that you can have immersion-based games which create the illusion of a simulated environment, which means that even within the classroom, you can actually simulate the environment of a workplace or, 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 or whatever have you. Uh, and obviously, I think that another important aspect of, of, of uh, gaming is to make assessment a bit more engaging or less painful, let's say, for the students, like, right? Uh, I mean, if you include some gaming elements, they might think a bit, you know, that this is not a test, this is not an exam. I'm actually playing and at the same time, you're testing their knowledge too. Uh, so to start off, uh, what we... Uh, want to what we we were already offering you know uh, the public and what we're going to be uh, releasing actually in two weeks time uh, uh, the upskills consortium and especially Vanessa Camilleri compiled a list from the department of AI of the University of Malta compiled the list of open access of off-the-shelf games and of, obviously the focus was on open access so that it's usable by 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 everyone interested regardless of of, um, of um, accessibility to resources that correspond to the domain clusters identified in the upskills needs analysis. Uh, so what Adriano presented uh, a couple of hours ago. 
So this uh, list basically establishes links to different learning outcomes in terms of knowledge, skills, and competencies. So basically we identified games and we are saying, okay, you can use this game in order to uh, help uh, students uh, in, improve their communication skills or their um, the problem solving skills or whatever have your critical thinking. And uh, the whole point of this list is not just to you know, to, to give you sort of pointers, but also to enable you to choose what you might want to integrate in your own teaching, in your curricular practice uh, in terms of a game. Uh, uh, our focus when compiling this list has been on the brevity of the gameplay. And by brevity, we don't mean that it's going to be a five minute long thing, but the focus is on having games that are 30 minutes to three hours long in line with our game preferences survey. The narrative that it is engaging and helps the students sort of get immersed. Uh, I mean, these are all educational games or games that have been specifically, you know, signposted as, as helping with learning, um, as well as the targeted skills. I think that uh, the, the game plot and the targeted skills are the most important aspects in this regard. So what do you want to get the students to, to do? Like, you know, be able to manage data a bit better or want them to be more creative with thinking about problems or whatever have you, and how you can actually achieve this through a game plot that is interesting and engaging. Uh, so a searchable version of this list will be released to our website and actually, you know, there is a lot of information and I think that this will be a very, very useful um, resource uh, for all academics and, and, and lecturers out there. Uh, and uh, if you, basically we're going to release it through a newsletter, so do sign up to our newsletter if you haven't already, uh, so that you get uh, the links and everything, but it's going to be on our website. Uh, and apart from the actual list of the games, we're also going to uh, have uh, guides for including games uh, in uh, your dedicated guides for including games in your curricula. And here's just an example. So basically, uh, this particular game, Tales of Escape, uh, it's related to specific uh, targeted skills within app skills. Uh, when we give recommendations about the audience, the target audience, what the requirements are, uh, whether someone needs to be an experienced gamer to play it, because obviously there are m more and less complex games. Uh, the game in experience, the skills targeted, learning outcomes through the game. And then we also have, you know, uh, a, a sort of a sketch of how this could actually be implemented uh, specifically in a lecture or, you know, as homework or whatever have you. Uh, so uh, it's not just the list of games that you get, but you also get um, a, a sort of guide of how you can use its specific uh, game within there. Uh, and then apart from the um, from the off-the-shelf games that we are, you know, we, we are promoting through uh, through upskills, all of which are open access, as I said before. We also created educational games, and as you know, this is not a simple process. Like this takes a lot of like manpower, time, and 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 and, and resources as well. Uh, so very soon, you're going to hear about more about two games that are more directly related to the content of our to, the, to our learning content. Uh, so the first one is Guess the Language. It will be presented after lunch uh, by uh, Genoveva and Margarita from Geneva, who are actually here right now. Uh, and basically the rationale between Guess the Language is how you can use a familiar game design, something that students are already familiar with, and then you can use it to teach it to teach something that you people might not have connected in their mind, like students might not have connected to the minds and make it a bit more accessible to them as well. So in this case, it's, you know, to teach how language works is a bit of an overstatement to, to teach a specific aspect of, of language. And then I'm going to be presenting at the end of, towards the end of this session, uh, Toplang, which is uh, basically uh, a simulation game, a text-based simulation game, uh, which has to do, which will actually showcase how you can actually simulate a work environment and engage students in learning or use it for assessment purposes too. For now, however, uh, we I would like to present, to very briefly present to you uh, a, a, what I've called a more widely applicable quiz game in the sense that this is a bit more generic. This is a resource that um, all educators can use regardless of disciplinary boundaries and whatnot. This has nothing to do with language per se. Uh, and this is the maze game, which was developed by the Department of AI. And uh, it's actually it's actually live and it works, but I would recommend if you access the website, we're gonna I think we're gonna fix this. Uh, there is very high 
uh, 80s style music playing <laughs> while you're you're playing the but anyway I mean it doesn't really matter so uh, this is the basic interface and you get two options one is to create the maze and the other is to play the maze I'll first showcase to you how playing the maze works so this is zoomed uh, this is um, fast forward twice so you're in a maze and you start, okay, uh, by going in a specific path. And then you can actually put the questions. So this is a question from my course on semantics, basically. So proposition is the right answer here. You go ahead. And then you get another question. And this time I'm going to give the wrong answer to the question, which leads you basically to a dead end. So you need to go back, you get in the main room. I mean, this is fast forward. That's why you're getting busy, I'm pretty sure. And then you answer the, the questions. And eventually, once you've done with all five, ten, however many questions you want to put there, uh, you get you know, you get the time that, that it took you and, 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 and whatnot. So I think that this is a, a fun resource to use generally for, uh, um, for you know, for, for, for teaching purposes or assessment purposes or whatever have you. Uh, and of course, the important thing here is that, okay, anyone can play a maze in the sense that uh, once you create a maze, it's stored on the database and then you get a code. Uh, so basically, uh, any academic or lecturer or whoever wants to use this, they can actually sign up for a very quick account and then create a maze by inputting uh, the questions. So um, there is a form, you just put in the question, the right answer, the wrong answer, and then the system creates the maze for you. Uh, so this is, I think, not like specific to language but you know it, it, it can be used uh, across the board and we think it's a fun way there needs to be a bit of tweaking still obviously with the code uh, but I think it's a nice example of, of, of what we've been uh, keeping busy with and finally I would like to finish off this because we're talking about games and the, the interest has been and, and the effort has been placed on games I think that it's really important to not take these as okay I need to have a game to do this or I need to get they have a game about that I think that our basic interest in games is obviously trying to engage the students more but uh, basically to gamify the learning experience to make it a bit more fun for the students rather than to just you know create games for the sake of creating games and when we're talking about gamification actually we never mean the creation of games, right? The creation of games is game design. It's something completely different. When we're talking about gamification, we we mean that we need we 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 want or we want to promote the incorporation of dynamics associated with game design in the educational environment. So this doesn't need to be specifically through the use of games. Uh, um, and you can actually gamify any type of learning content you have rather than just use a full blown game. Uh, and there is a preference, you know, uh, there is, a, there are reasons why you would opt for this. You know, if you uh, learn exclusively from gameplay, this might actually have the opposite effect to the students. So because they're going to be like, I came here to learn something. I didn't come to play a game. I didn't come to play a game. So we need to be cautious also with the use of games in that in the regard. And also from our own gameplay preference survey, you know, if you give, if you deliver a course through a game completely, you know, there, there is a big portion of, of people that you're actually going to lose out on, right? Because there are individuals, believe it or not, who don't really play at all. So, uh, we're not gamers at all. Uh, so basically the idea here is that even if you don't want to implement a specific game or our games or, or the official games or whatnot, you can still gamify your curriculum. You can still gamify your teaching by incorporating feature of game design into it. And this is really easy, especially if you're using a digital learning environment like Moodle or Canvas or whatever have you uh, as a solution. You can just, just give the students the ability to upload pictures or create avatars or put like a, a nice phrase next to their name or whatnot. You know, this will help them boost their confidence and get more engaged in class. Uh, give them a point system to mark achievements, 
completion badges or whatever have you. These are really simple tasks where you just give them a pat on the back when they're done reading their or reading or whatnot for a particular unit. Uh, signposted signpost progression stages. There, there can be progress bars. I think that even when you yourself are engaged with some content, you know, so seeing that you've reached halfway through it is an achievement. So it's it's good for the students to get this motivation to, yeah, you're doing great, you can move on as well. Uh, and then uh, you can also create a, a bit of a storyline. So you can come in class and say, okay, I'm, we're going to do talk about corpora or we're going to talk about something, you know, specific to, to, to linguistic research or whatnot. Uh, but this can actually be applied uh, in this particular setting like you're in a company and you have to do this in order to complete a particular task or whatever have you and then you can go back to the storyline as you're teaching the nitty-gritties right uh, and whatnot or you can still keep leaderboards for competitive tasks or whatever have you like when you give them something to discuss you can actually assign uh, or you know you get the, the best idea to lead the group in in finding a, um, a solution to the problem or whatever so all of these are tips that don't necessarily rely on actual games but i think they're they're bound to make uh, learning a, a bit more uh, um, engaging so now we have the open q a uh, question which i'd like to open to both uh, to both the online and, and, and the on-site participants. Uh, this actually applies to all the presentations. As far as I know, Lonica is still with us, so she can also... Yes, Lonica is still with us, so good. I, I was intrigued by what you said about um, uh, learning outcome being somehow too constrictive, but I, what, what we were discussing actually after your presentation is what, like, what could we use instead? I mean, it is clear that when we are teaching, we need to have an objective an object teaching in mind, something that we wish a student or the group of students to learn. So if we do not have learning objective, how do we structure our content? You always uh, need to set uh, objectives or outcomes. Um, again, sometimes there's also a slight difference between the two. I mean, you know, outcomes are sort of, uh, you know, sort of prescriptive in the sense that they are, uh, you know, place that preparation stage objective sometimes a little bit more particular, maybe a little bit more lesson based. But the, but then there are also other models which uh, actually can be used for educational frameworks, which are mainly more process based. This does not mean, of course, that this does not involve having outcomes and objectives, but it all depends on how religiously, if if I may put it in in, in maybe in, in in lay terms one is actually going to stick to those type of outcomes, uh, which of course sometimes is a little, I don't know. I mean, I don't know what your experience is in higher education, but sometimes this is becoming a problem in our educational system here in Malta, where, let me not speak about higher education, schools have moved to an outcome-based educational approach. And it is also being used as a tool um, to, for example, uh, not only evaluate learning, but to evaluate teachers. It becomes, uh, you know, sometimes within the faculty, we call it death by tick box, you know, unless you get so many ticks because you have completed so many outcomes, then you might not have been considered to have succeeded. Okay. Now, it, that is when uh, an outcome-based approach can become problematic because it becomes too prescriptive. You have to understand that when you are actually creating outcomes, they can also be used as a way to guide your learning, okay? Not only as something that you religiously have to get to, and there may be cases where outcomes, which are prescribed at the beginning of a course, may not be reached because they may be superseded by others, okay? And this is when it becomes more process-based, okay? Not just a matter of reaching the outcomes, but possibly seeing where one might have got to at the end of a cycle, and then, you know, in a cyclical approach, seeing whether what might not have been reached can actually be built upon and not seeing what not might have been reached as a fault. So that's a bit the difference between what is a very strictly, I mean, the outcome-based model, all right, uh, pedagogically, um, you know, um, came, into, came into being, um, especially in the United States, in order to counterpose more teacher-based models, okay, which were more traditional, you know, as we've been saying this morning. Um, 
but now they've become, you know, the mantra. Uh, it's as if they've, they've, you know, come up, come upon us and they're not questioned by anybody. They're, 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 they're seen as, you know, something that we have to do. Most of us academics do it basically uh, as a paper pushing exercise, let's be honest. Okay, because when we come to design course, we, we've spoken about accreditation. I mean, we are forced, if you like, to do learning outcomes and we do it as a, you know, uh, as a bit of a paper pushing exercise. I mean, this is what I just questioned in my presentation. But then again, it's all a matter um, of how strictly you adhere to outcomes, what you do of them, whether you see them as conducive to what is actually happening, and also seeing whether sometimes there are also alternative models, which are more process-based rather than outcome-based. But wouldn't then just be a matter of switching the type of outcomes that you expect? So something that, as you said, is more process-based rather than focusing on some notions, because, because I guess before we were referring to mostly notions that we, are ex we expect to be acquired. And another thing I that spoke to me now that you were presenting, that you were replying, sorry, was about um, sec uh, secondary education, so not tertiary, not university level. And I could see how outcomes can, in the traditional sense in this case, could be useful to evaluate how things go across the board within a country, for instance, so to compare different institutions, because I guess in a more alternative model, what you've been describing now, it would be a bit different, difficult to evaluate whether how things are going in different schools. Yeah, you're right on this in the sense that outcomes also, you know, so, sometimes they come a little bit linked to another word, but that sometimes we don't particularly like, which is quality assurance, right? Um, it, it is a bit that type of you know, uh, process towards education, which does then to, you know, make sure that, I mean, there, there is, the fact is also that there is a little bit less freedom in the way we educate our children today, even in schools, in the sense that, I mean, you, you and even at university, I mean, the, the, ti the time has passed. I mean, I, when, I, when I started working at university in 2001, I could create my own course, do my own thing without necessarily having, you know, the administrative structures checking out on me. And of course, there's a, there's a, there's a positive to that, there's a negative to that, there's undoubtedly, okay? I mean, th that's a fact. Um, what, I'm, what I'm just, um, you know, I, and, and then again, of course, the outcome-based the outcome -based approach does have many valid points in it. And I myself, I'm not convinced that possibly alternative models could be better. But my main, my main point is that it is also useful to reflect on what the outcome-based model is all about, where it comes from, and sometimes, especially in higher education, where, of course, you've got also, um, you know, all the students, helping them understand that, listen, if I have this learning content, which is upskills, let's say, or whichever learn, in which I have outcomes, okay, understand why there are outcomes, how we have, I mean, you, you, at higher education, that is, the, that is the great advantage that you've got, that you can actually speak to your students about the way you yourself have framed the type of content that you have, um, uh, have devised for them, which is great. Of course, in secondary and in primary education, sometimes it's different because, of course, you, you set the outcomes and it's difficult to explain to students why they are there, but at higher education, you can do so. Okay, but um, so, so let me be clear. I mean, I'm not, you know, saying this is uh, an approach which should be changed, but uh, it's good to reflect upon it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it, that's it. And let's not take it as if it's been there forever because it hasn't. Let's not take it that it's been there and it will be there forever because it will not. And let's keep in mind also from maybe, because very few people maybe who are out maybe of my field um, um, actually realize that, you know, outcome-based framework for education has a history. It's come from somewhere. Uh, it might be good sometimes just to, to, dig, to dig up a little bit about it. I think for all of us, including myself, of course. <laughs> Thank you very much. I mean, if I may add to this, and, and yes, Sarah, I'll come to you. No, 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 I mean, if I may add to this, I think that this is a, you know, the struggle is real to, to a certain extent. I mean, we, uh, I, I, I can only talk, you know, on behalf of the consortium as well. I mean, when we started uh, discussing how we're going to deliver the learning content and, and all that stuff, I mean, there, there was a bit of pushback even within the, the, the consortium, right? To, to the extent that, you know, some people were trying to focus specifically on the process in the sense of, you know, okay, we need to get students to know how to, I don't know, do machine learning or, or whatever have you, right? Uh, and then 
Others were sort of focused on the outcome and on the traditional way of doing this thing. So we had to, we had to have a lot of like debate even within the group, you know, to make sure that, okay, active learning has to do with like how you're getting someone to, to appreciate X and Y. And at least, at least when it comes to the games, I think that this is what precisely I've been trying to put forward through the description of IO4, that it's not a matter of using the game because if you play this game, you're going to learn how to count graphs or whatever i mean you know statistics or whatnot the point is that you're gonna think a bit out of the box about something that you're doing outside of context like if you think about it whenever we're teaching i mean okay i'm using statistics as an example but i think it's a very well you know you, you give all these scenarios that like you know you you, you throw a, a, a pair of dice yeah it is interesting intellectually but it's not like you know you're gonna not everyone is a backgammon player who are obsessed with how dice work, right? So implementing this in a different storyline that is relevant. So, you know, you, you buy food every day, you have to pay, I don't know, whatever, you know, finding another example can actually have this effect. You learn the same thing, you fulfill the outcome, but it's how you fulfill it. And I think, I, 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 I mean, personally, I 100% agree and 10% agree with Sandra, like learning outcomes, no matter how you take them, they're pretty much the same across the board. I haven't seen any course that has any like really out of the box learning outcomes. Like it's just, okay, I need to cover the disciplinary knowledge, engage the students, get them to communicate better, presentation skills. I mean, it's it's like, yeah, it's, it's a paper pushing exercise. So it's good to go back to a certain extent and then think about, okay, I'm delivering this. How can I make it more engaging? How can I make it whatever? I mean, I know you're doing it because you've already designed a course that does exactly that. So it's not, but I think it's important. It's not to diminish the need for outcomes or anything. It's more to, you know, to sort of like, okay, we have a nice, you know, cogwheel. We perhaps we need to think whether the pieces are connecting well in the cogwheel because there is this procedure that we're all taking for granted. Like I need to description, learning outcomes, blah, 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 activities, and that's it. But anyway, that's my two cents. Um, I think I have a comment more than anything, and, and maybe it will be directed in part towards Lonica. And I suspect that what I'm going to say is going to be a bit rambling and disconnected, but I'm, this is the only place that I can think of saying it. Um, there's a few things that popped out uh, from all of the talks today. Um, and I guess I'd start with uh, the word motivation or even the, the intrinsic motivation um, and the idea also that uh, we're working a little bit with a very big elephant in the room, which someone else also mentioned in relation to the idea that we don't actually know, in many cases, as teachers, as educators, what it is we are preparing our students for. The, the future that they are looking at is not even necessarily something that we can conceive. Um, someone, someone mentioned something like, you know, maybe, maybe even five years from now, we don't even know what, what our students' skills actually need. Exactly. So, so um, Yana, you're mentioning ChatGPT. I mean, it's it maybe it's one thing that has like hit us um, a, a little bit quite hard. You know, at the beginning of the year, brand new year, January, full of hope and all of that, and you get ChatGPT thrown at you, and all of a sudden, how many other jobs are are in question? So, I guess my um, the, the observation that I have also is a little bit related to what Lonica was saying earlier, because as far as I understand it, you know, there's where one strong link with with what we are broadly calling industry. And in a sense, it's it's bringing me full circle to question as an educator, our motivation, and therefore how we convey our motivation to our students who uh, I think themselves are, are feeling this sense of, well, I don't really know uh, what it is uh, that I should be preparing my future for. And in this context, I think um, we, we were talking about a, a, um, another project that the, that the Institute is trying to build, which is this Olympiads thing, which is 
basically a, a set of comp competitive um, uh, games that we involve young students in, so so secondary school and, and, and higher education and so on, which is essentially, I mean, relating to what Snavros was saying uh, with respect to, to games, uh, at the end of the day, do we actually just want to inject a little bit of fun into the classroom? Because apart from anything else, we are largely working with the unknown. I don't know if that's a cop-out or if it's an actual uh it, you know it's something useful for us to build on and the reason i singled out lonica and, and her so i did warn you i was going to be a bit uh, uh <laughs> rambling because i'm i'm basically trying to connect all these thoughts but my my question was directed really towards lonica in the sense that how do you actually involve industry today in such a way that it's it is actually relevant to the students when at the same time we're saying, yeah, well, maybe by the time you get out of university, this version of the job actually isn't going to necessarily look the same. So it's, it's not a question I'm expecting you to answer so much as to put out there, you know, and in, in, in relation to questioning everything that we've been discussing today, basically. Thanks. Yeah. Sorry, 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 but thanks. <laughs> indeed, indeed a hard one, but a very interesting one as well. So first of all, we, we cannot look into the future. That is, it, of course, and things move so quickly, especially if you look now at the NLP field, even for me as a researcher in AI, it moves so quickly that I can hardly uh, keep up with all these uh, different uh, technologies that are being used and, and uh, shown to the public and uh, the effects it has on society. It's really quite hard to... To keep up with that, I think, well, one thing I think in these industry and uh, higher education uh, collaborations is that we, the project that we've seen, we're actually not uh, that much um, kind of influenced by these like hypes and uh, things that appear all of a sudden, but they were more like... At that moment, what does this company need? And and maybe in in a few years there will be other things. But I hope that the, they were they will be general enough that students will learn some basic things, like for example, um, uh, working in in a team with other people, um, working with uh, people with different objectives. Whereas you're as a student interested in maybe the 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 linguistic uh, parts of, a, of a, an assignment the company will be looking at practical uh, aspects how do you deal with such a kind of um, trade-off between these things uh, so yeah making i hope that they learn from these things more general abilities that will be useful even if the future changes a little bit and then the other thing that you were saying about teachers motivations I think there there is a, a, a point there which I, I I actually maybe only realized when you said it and that is that the, the teachers that they are are, are are taught by like the lecturers are the ones that didn't choose the industrial career right so the, the they will be the ones that are are not maybe the best people to um convince them of of looking into these industrial aspects because they they did they didn't choose that route they re really went for the like fundamental uh research so uh yeah there is indeed there a, a problem that i that i see which um which well i even see that actually in in my uh in the, the setup where i'm working currently in a way fundamental research is somehow seen as a kind of uh better more prestigious uh, than uh, applied research so I guess that this is also something that plays a role uh, with linguistics and language students that uh, if you can focus really on research without thinking of practical aspects or whether this is commercially valid or useful it sounds like you're doing more the real thing and and this is um, something that uh, that uh, that might also be in in, in a, some way true but on the other hand thinking of your future and uh, how you're going to make a living, then you get all these practical aspects. Uh, it might be good to also see the other side. Um, and injecting fun, I think, is always good. <laughs> so let's do that anyway. Uh, and uh, maybe focusing on that, uh, not making these industrial placements or just industrial collaborations a painful thing is one of the main things, so that at least they get something out that, you know, is fun. Uh, they learn something from it, hopefully 
more uh, general things and just things that are so much tailored to the, the the current situation only. Yeah, I guess that's that's all I I, I can say towards your difficult question. Uh, maybe somebody else has something to say about this. I mean, if I may add, it's Tavros again. You can't see me, but. I think that, no, I think that this is important and I think that at, at the same time, you know, the whole point of engaging the industry or whatnot, I'm thinking about the journey that our students have taken, for example, we started off this uh, natural language processing or language technology course or, or whatever you want to call it, but this is an NLP thing. Uh, and when we started it in 2011 here at the University of Malta, I don't think the chat GPT was even like a, a, a conception <laughs> in anyone's mind, right? Because the, the, the technology wasn't there yet or whatnot. And within the last 10, 11 years, like we have, the curriculum itself has changed. But I'm thinking that the people who got their first degree when there was no AI like in, in that stage, I mean, to the extent that you expose the students to methods and whatnot, I think that you're giving them what they need in order to work out stuff and i think that this is where where where, where upskills can really be seen in the sense that yes the transversal skills are really important because at the end of the day this is what you're going to get like i'm pretty sure that what i learned during my my, my school years not my, my 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 ba years they're no longer going to be applicable you know in in 20 years time as the mainstream theorizing for language or whatnot so as long as i've got the skills to do research and blah, blah, whatever and read on my own then you know I, I keep myself up to date I, I think that's the more sensitive sort of sensible way of, of, of looking at this no? but yeah it is it is an issue obviously and I think for me the biggest issue with the industry specifically is you know trying to align the two perspectives like trying to make sure that you know the students get enough knowledge and the, the practicality is so you know the, the company usually targets practicality, like I need the results as soon as possible or whatever. And then the academic needs to make sure that the students also gets to learn things by doing what they're doing. So I think that this is the, you know, but but, but I see this as a, something that contributes to a certain extent and contributes in a larger scale. It's not necessarily that because you've annotated, like, you know, our, our task, like the, the, the student we engaged in the industry project, they had to come up with swear words for, you know, for, for hate speech or whatnot. Like, this is not a fun task. But at the end of the day, you get to see the applicability of of, 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 of what you're doing. So, yeah. Anyway, just it may be rewarding sense. also because you, it's used in a real... Exactly, yeah. Case, you... Right? What you're doing. So that that can maybe the, be the fun in this case, that it, it's it's more rewarding and you're, you're really contributing. Uh, and there was something I wanted to react to. I forgot in what you were saying, the transversal skills being, but yeah, also, I think what we're trying to do in upskills is also get people that maybe not naturally are driven towards either a complex technological task or industry, get them uh, to, to get in touch with this and see that it's maybe not so much, uh, so far away from their interests as yeah, they true. thought, right? It's also a little bit like, you know, getting out of your comfort zone. Somebody said that also today uh, and doing things that you, you would normally not do and then seeing like, oh, actually there's something in there that I do like and it's not so so bad. And it's, uh, yeah, I, I guess that's what we also try to do both with uh, introducing some uh, technical skills and, and also by uh, having these collaborations with industry. Thank you. Any more quick questions, comments, even from online? Yes. Uh, a question to Stavros. No, the, my, my, uh, of course, keep in mind that I'm from the generation that was brought up on arcade games, playing Space Invaders and Pac-Man. So, 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 so please keep, but when, when it comes to gamification, right? And when it comes, for example, I mean, okay, show us the maze game. And when it comes to assessment, because that, that's, this is a question which I find very difficult to answer. I mean, in, in the case, especially of, you know, like these upskill learning content sort of modules and things, in that specific case, I mean, is there space then also for open-ended answers? Because, you know, when everything is close-ended and the student then automatically finds the correct answer because by getting something wrong, then they'll find something right. Duolingo style, if you know what I mean, if I can relate to that. I mean, 
you can't really assess because you, you, you get to an answer by elimination rather than by using your, your, your skills and your competencies. Is, is there, I mean, obviously, let me repeat, is, I'm not sure if there's an answer to that or if maybe you've thought about it, I'm, I'm not sure. Yes, it has been, it hasn't been just like a thought, it has been one of the limitations of trying to work with top line because I, I sort of designed the thing and, and tried to put, to make sense of, of how to do this. I mean, uh, one of the issues is, yes, the whole quiz nation. Do you want to respond? Ah, okay. So one of the issues that you're facing when you're dealing with gamification is that, okay, you need to keep things fun, you need to keep things open-ended, but at the same time, you cannot expect that the student will just come up with the right answer. And because we're implementing things on an online setting or through software and whatnot, like getting free text is a no-go because there's no way you can check it or give feedback or whatever have you. So yes, the quiz-based approach does not really, is not 100% conducive, but what you can do is you can complexify a bit the question or the answers could be very similar to one another so that you can really, you know, the, the whole point is not to get them to get the right answer. I think the whole point, and, and I will show an example this afternoon or whatnot, like, you know, if you tell them that you want to use this method or that method and they need to apply it to a specific problem, they need to think of the methods. So even if one of the two, but if both are very similar, then obviously this requires thinking, okay, which would apply to this specific problem? So we're talking about word embeddings, for example, and the extent to which I'm not sure because Nonaki, you know more about that. But like, uh, there are two, like doing like a custom-made version or doing a ready-made version or whatnot. This essentially leads, you know, the student to think. At the same time, what we are, I don't know how, how to what extent can be used for assessment. You can also have open-ended tasks in the sense that they need to write a paragraph about something within a game or they need to, um, you know, they need to compile a corpus, let's say, because it's needed for research and whatnot. So these are the, the list of the headlines and you need to give me the zip file with, with uh, or the sketch engine file or whatever have you with that. This would be far more complex than what we're currently implementing, but the rationale is this, that basically instead of just giving them an assignment and telling them for your assignment for this class or whatnot, you know, imagine that you are, I don't know, in a, um, in an education specialist company and whatnot, and that they've asked you to develop a, a new experimental, whatever, uh, program of studies, like teaching education. I think that this could motivate a bit more. So that's the aspect of the gamification that we can use to this effect. When it comes to assessment, yes. I mean, if we had the resources and if there was like an ideal world or whatnot, you could hire an actor. They could actually like do an interview or whatever have you. I mean, it could be, could be even more lifelike. But even this, li this little thing, that's why I'm talking about gamification. It's not like having a game instead of a, of a quiz. I mean, yes, the game, the maze game, I think is, you know, the, the fact that you don't get many options or whatnot is very limiting, but it's a limitation of the design. So it's not, uh, but generally speaking, I think that the assessment, we can actually in include this um, a bit more visibly in assessment, but we cannot really gamify assessment altogether. I think that would be in, impractical and impossible. So. That a key component, maybe of this idea of using games is that they allow a certain degree of simulation. And you don't really even need to create a big story around that. You can simply say, hey, see this game, it works in this way. There are components going back also to what Lonek is saying. So, uh, you can interact with this game. Even if you study linguistics, even if you study translation, we will show you how you can interact with the programming. So be a little less technophobic. And we're really talking about BA levels, so first class, first year. And um, by doing this little bit of fumbling with the code, not only you will learn how to read it, not how to code, but how to read this code, but also you need to learn about the reasoning that you need to implement maybe another little chapter of this game. So by simulating an activity that is just like constructing a game, you can introduce a task that then is actually relatively easy to evaluate, even in a very traditional sense, because after you give them the instructions to do so, and you give them the rationale, 
and some theoretical tools, then I, they should be able to implement that specific operation by putting together these three elements. And you can evaluate in a pretty straightforward way, as you would do with a paper potentially, whether they were able to perform that task or not. Simply that the components that are included in that specific task are not strictly academic, like they or not academic with respect to our domain. So they involve a little bit more thinking. Uh, each course, each learning contact has also included use cases that I can discuss with the students, for example, via role play and makes them reflect and think of real problems that happen both in the industry and research. For example, data privacy in research, we are using, we have created an, uh, a role play scenario where the students imagine themselves in the role of a data controller, for example, you know, and those activities that they like as well. Um, and so there is a combination of use cases, quizzes, uh, just to check retention on, on a specific theoretical matter or um, and then uh, the use cases um, research topics that I need to investigate and write a report uh, in the form of a blog post for example so it's a combination and a lot of examples of different things that teachers can just cherry pick and and try to reuse so. My name is Vanessa Camilleri I, I lecture at the Department of AI um, at the University of Malta um, and Basically, um, today's discussion is about sort of best practices for game based learning and, of course, during this talk i'll be talking um, about games, um, but the issue will be mostly in trying to provoke you into thinking how and in which games. Um, in which ways games can be utilized for for learning um, not in any way, and this is sort of like what I see from my point of view as a kind of common mistake when we um, think about games for learning, not in any way um, that teachers or educators or lect lecturers might think about teaching, but it's a form of learning um, through game-based learning that is born out of a need to know something that can be anything. Um, now, games, um, we usually categorize games as a form of media. Um, there are games that possess great complexity, there are games that remain unfamiliar to us. There are games that evoke certain nostalgic memories from our youth. However, it appears that many individuals tend to view games primarily as a source of entertainment. Nevertheless, when considering game-based learning, I believe that we have to set aside our preconceptions and um, regard games as any other medium that contributes to the learning process. Um, just as we approach books, films, YouTube videos, Instagram reels, um, papers as sources of knowledge, we can also explore games that have the potential to enhance, to enrich, to support, to stimulate, to instill a desire to learn in people. Now, um, we have two aspects, and this project does tackle two aspects, that of gamification and game-based learning, and they are very different. When we talk about gamification, what we want is to try and motivate people in doing what might be a boring task. So we assign badges, we give points, we create leaderboards, and we trigger some sort of competition to give people some edge. In game-based learning, we do not necessarily create this type of competition that is based on what we call extrinsic rewards. Instead, most often as game researchers, we see that the type of rewards that games would build on are more of the intrinsic type. So you get a gamer that might not always be after the rewards per se, but the active involvement that some games require to solve problems, to maybe overcome challenges, to cooperate, to collaborate at a social level. And these all these serve as a means of engagement that would transcend rewards in terms of point, points and badges. Now, as a case example, I was recently speaking to a colleague of mine, and he was telling me how even a simple exercise uh, using Slido um, and assigning some points to a task was motivating some of the students taking his class. So he's a computer scientist. He teaches various study units in AI. And every time he used to go to class and ask students if they have questions, nobody would respond. Um, so he sort of said, let, let me try to call out names. So then he started to single out people from class and ask them questions. 
you know, um, but he caught the discomfort. Some people were rather uncomfortable at being called out in class and answering questions in front of others. So he started using Slido. He creates quizzes. He creates some open questions. Students scan the code and answer very simply. Sometimes he asks for the names, etc. And then he started noticing as well that initially students were helping each other out. So they were uh, realizing that, you know, some people had some problems next time. They were, you know, going there and say, okay, you answered this way. Um, so he sort of um, did a small experiment and he assigned them um, points on a leaderboard and he would say every now and then, okay, let's check who's on top now, okay, we've done five questions, oh look, there's somebody who's on top, who's leading the pack, and suddenly he observed that the attitudes were changing in a way that at one point people were not really, well, they weren't really like, you know, um, not helping each other, but they were helping each other much less sort of happily because they also wanted to get some points. But it wasn't just about helping. They he was noticing that people who were ordinarily, you know, almost half asleep or not participative in class, um, they were suddenly quite alert. And all of a sudden they were joking amongst themselves like, oh, look, who's woken up, you know, and everybody was trying to do some effort. And that effort he felt was really good. So he started doing more of these and suddenly in his class there was some enthusiasm and suddenly he saw there was a bit of a change. And this is an example of a gamification exercise, something very simple, which used a bit of points to motivate those people into answering some questions, but not just answering questions, but actually doing a bit of an effort to look up the answers, you know, to check whether they were answering correctly. Um, so again, may I add that this was a very informal exercise. It wasn't done to, you know, um, to sort of uh, cause um, some disadvantages to some students. Um, it was just a bit of a happy competition um, that students were using to be in the lead. And, you know, um, it, was, it wasn't meant to set of people against each other, but it does provide a moment of fun, this break in the lecture that is definitely more interactive and it seems perceived as more fun. So um, we can go for an example, shall we? So um, if you can, okay, you can take your camera, um, your mobile, scan the code and go there. And we have an active Slido, which I will share with you. So you should have a Slido, which allows you to create some sort of words. Okay. In fact, we will be creating a word cloud through this. Um, Slido is very versatile, so you can create any questions that you want. Um, but it's just, you know, it's just to get your thoughts at this point. I'm not, I'm not intending to have any sort of leaderboards or, or, or scores or there's nothing wrong or right here. But it's just, you know, to show how also, um, in a way, um, how, how students feel when they have something of the sort that's going on. Okay, so now you should see this. You should see the word cloud coming up and all the people who are typing and all the participants. And you should, you can also see what's happening um, on the screen. And, you know, even, even the people who are online can, of course, um, should participate. So to the question, answer to the question, like in what ways would you perceive games as helping learning? Okay, so we've got entertaining, motivation, releasing tension, attention, participation, making notions fun, generating fun, um, engagement, attractive. There's this element of fun that keeps coming up, right? And engagement. Right, it seems that we don't have any more people participating and 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 typing. So this is this is an example. We have another example later on, but um, we'll come to that in a moment. So this is sort of the sort of example that my colleague was actually talking about and was dis was discussing with me, um, and I thought. You know, in a way, we can always somehow gamify our lectures, our, our way of teaching and our learning just by, you know, creating simple activities. But sometimes we need something a little bit more different. And when it comes to games and game-based learning, then 
there is an edit point which we need to understand that makes it all different. It doesn't mean that gamification would exclude game-based learning. It doesn't mean that because in our courses we decide to go for a game-based learning approach, we cannot use some gamifying elements. And it doesn't mean that if we mostly gamify or decide to gamify some um, some some concepts in our study units, then we can't use games as well for others. But speaking about games, um, let's try and see how different they are. A game, in contrast to gamification, has some set rules. Um, it has uh, a win state. So you can, you can either win, you can lose, you can also stalemate, as in chess. Now, um, this here is an example of a game. And this game introduces some programming rules as well. But more than programming, I would say that when, that when utilized, this game helps people solve problems. So as part of our... Um, AI, okay, program um, and computer science. We want certain, we want students to possess certain skills. Of course, there are the coding and programming, um, you know, issues. But more than that, we want students to understand there is a problem and try to approach solving the problem from different angles. And this is an example of how we can use. Um, a game like this. So I'll, I'll show you. I'll show you a bit how it looks. Yeah. So this is this is um, the 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 game itself. It's called Assignment Forty Two, um, and basically you have an assignment to complete, and certain assignments, um, certain tasks need your ability um, to program. So, for example, to program a robot to be able to extinguish a fire. Okay, so you have missions, you have tasks. Now, this is a very simple programming exercise, as you can see, with iconic programming. But the issue here, again, is not even programming per se. It is um, the ability of students um, to actually go through a problem solving, a problem solving process. And this is what we want to achieve. So what we do and the way we, we um, use games in such an instance is this. So um, we we ask students to play games sometimes in class but also sometimes outside class and we accompany them through the gameplay by setting certain questions, certain tasks that they need to answer. For example, I use the VLE. So I ask questions about their gameplay. Okay, what challenges did you meet? Um, how did you solve them? Um, what is the process of solution for this for this particular game? And, and from then onwards, I start understanding and observing whether the sort of skill set that I am targeting through this game has indeed um, been reached. Um, the issue is this, okay, and this is where this is where we really need to think about it. This is where you know there needs to be a bit of of of, of provocation to it too as well. Um, in this case, problems are given they need to be solved, otherwise they would stay in the same place, okay? Otherwise they stay in the same room, they go nowhere, nowhere they do nothing. Um, so we need people to think logically, to think creatively, to think in a structured way. We, as in, you know, people coming from, from my area, um, in a structured way, but possibly using out-of-the-box solutions. Um, the result when playing such games is that we don't really tell them what they are learning. We don't really know what they are learning. We don't really control the skills they are getting, all the skills they might be getting. But the design of the game itself tells us that this can help people hone in on their problem solving skills. So in essence, what I'm saying is this, we find a game, we go through the game ourselves, we play the game, we try to understand the, play, the game from a design perspective. Once we understand what sort of skill set that game can target, okay, sometimes there's research about the game that makes our life a bit easier. Um, but once we um, understand what sort of skill set, main skill set, the game targets, then we do not control what happens in the game. We do not control the sort of learning that happens in a game. The game has a task, the student 
um, carries out the task, performs the task, if they reach the objective of the game, then we may say, you know, that he has reached some problem solving, solving abilities. Okay, we don't know the extent of which, but we know that he or she have managed to solve the game. And this is about game based learning. And this is something which makes it a bit controversial in itself, because we're used to assessing, you know, this chunk of knowledge, my students have attained these learning outcomes with games that is not so easy it is not isn't i do not subscribe to the idea that we design games to assess a particular chunk of knowledge we it's like giving them the tools and they learn what they they extract what they get from it what they can from it this is a different approach. This is Roblox, and Roblox is used very much in game-based learning, especially with higher education and with university students. It's a different approach to game-based learning. First of all, Roblox is not a game per se. Um, similarly to it, there is Minecraft. They're called sandbox games, um, and they are not games, but they are platforms to help people create games. They can help people meet and socialize within the game that is created in it, and as a platform, Form. They, we know, okay, research tells us that they support creativity, they facilitate interaction, and they help people develop their content creation skills. And these are the sort of transversal skills that I'm talking about. I know Roblox would target creativity, would target interaction, would target, you know, content creation. But do, can I really measure empirically whether such things and in which level have been attained? I do not think we can, because if we do, if people and researchers say, oh, I know I can measure creativity, then, you know, I, I think they're, <laughs> they're, they're generalizing when they shouldn't, you know, and this is, this is the sort of mistake I kept seeing when it comes to game-based research. So let me, the thing is this, so, um, so whether we think of game-based learning or gamification or anything that has to do with learning, we need to focus on an extremely important question. Okay, and this is the question. What is the most valuable thing for a student? What would you think is the most valuable thing for a student? Because game-based learning is not about the teacher, it's about the student, right? So what's the most valuable thing for the student? Maybe getting the grade? Yeah, if I look at my students, you know, <laughs> you know, they're very happy if they get the grade. Um, I know maybe it shouldn't be the highest thing, but if you want to be realistic, you know, what's the most valuable thing for a student, for my students, is getting the grade. Um, so possibly, okay, there can be many, many, many things, you know, that students might have most value in. Um, the main issue that they want, you know, they might have place value to their learning that's not educational per se, like getting the grade, right? But whatever it is, um, what they want is to get it without too much suffering, okay? So whatever skills, they just want to get it without too much suffering. And now let me show you this. So, so you know what this is, right? It's the periodic table of elements. It's horrible for whoever has had this at school. The struggle to learn this is very real. It's given, but you still need to study it. Um, and then let me show you this. Okay, so do you know what this is? It's part of a chart. It's a very long chart. As you can see, it's quite complex. And my 14 year old, my soon to be 14 year old knows this off without any problems at all. Okay. In his own words, when I asked him about it, he said, of course, everyone knows about that. You have to. And I promise I never threatened him that I would cut off his internet to learn this. Okay. Now, this is the Pokemon dual activity chart. Every, um, you know, person who, who plays Pokemon and is a self-respected Pokemon gamer knows this. And when I say every self-respected Pokemon player, we're talking about, as of May 2023, it was about 80 million monthly players, okay? This is the dual activity. There's the, the activity type chart, which is a bit less complex, okay? Um, you see, nobody makes them study this off by heart. Nobody splats it onto them on a PowerPoint presentation and tells them, look, you have to learn what this is, okay? And you have to learn who wins what. 
Um, okay, now on the screen, you can't see it clearly, but of course on the, on, on the website, it's all very clear about who has power over what, okay? What sort of abilities win over others, who's fire, who's water, you know, all this thing. And you have to know it if you're going in for a dual activity, because if you don't, you're going to lose. And nobody wants to lose. Um, they, don't like, they don't like losing. People who play games don't like losing. They lose, but they don't like it. So what games can such as this do, do, they create a need that transcends this hard work of learning something of by heart. Okay, people don't just go up, oh, I have to study Pokemon chart, I have to, they don't do that. Okay, because it's their need, you know, they, they, they do it very happily so that they can learn it. Um, so they're using this, okay, all the time, the knowledge gained from it to achieve this particular goal of winning. Now, what we want to ask ourselves is what if we build a real need for people to learn something we think is really worth learning? The previous question I asked, what do you think is the most valuable thing for a student? And I said, maybe getting the grade. What if we build a need that transcends that getting the grade? What if they find the need of learning something, maybe not in terms of content, but also in terms of the competency they can achieve or the skill set they achieve? What if we, th we give them something which they think, which is very important, they have to think it's really worth learning. Now, um, if we use, we, we can think of using anything as a medium, but what the question is, what if we use a game as a medium to do this? Okay, so this is, this is all about, in my opinion, game-based learning. Um, one of the best ways forward in using this game-based learning approach, first of all, is to define who the audience is. You want to know who your audience is. And then in comes your experience, your expertise as an educator and as a lecturer. And in this, you have to define the most salient concepts we want to impart to them. It's not about knowledge. This is not about spilling our knowledge into their brains. Um, this is a version of teaching that I think game-based learning is not good at, okay? When you put in the knowledge and you want them to, to get that knowledge. We can't use game-based learning for that. If we want to teach content, then we might decide to gamify okay that content and that is fine you make it a bit more motivating and that is in essence one of the outcomes from this project but if there is an aspect of our training courses a learning outcome may be pertinent to competencies or skills that we think would best benefit our students then after specifying the audience the second step we need to take is to identify that competence or skill set we want our students to equip themselves with okay so we define the audience well we know who the audience is and we th we think of competencies and skill sets that we think would best suit um that particular audience and what they're aiming towards so i think that this project itself upskills it it is it's what it has done so far. So it has identified the audience, it has identified competences, skill sets. Okay. And then also, please, that when it comes to games, I refrain purposely from using the terms content in relation to games, control of knowledge, or testing whether that knowledge has been gained or not. I don't think games can do that. OK, um, I do not subscribe and I repeat myself in that with the notion um, for learning with games. I believe that what we can gain from well-designed games um, would go goes beyond um, that. And, you know, relegating games to that is not exploiting them as we could or as we should. To me, games is about like planting a seed. It may or may not grow. It may grow into a budding flower or it may go, grow into a herb. It may be used later for decoration or it may be used to create an entire garden patch. And this might be seen sort of as a romantic view of games, but this is exactly why I feel many game-based learning approaches fail. We have tried a lot of game-based learning approaches in the past. And what happens is that sometimes the novelty wears off and people play a game and then you do a survey to see whether they have learned something from the game. You 
issue a publication, a paper, and you say, oh, they have learned everything about astronomy, okay, through playing that game. And I do not think that what real value-driven games um, can give is that. I think that if you relegate games to that, you're not really exploiting the games to their potential because games have got much more potential than that. They can help people think in higher order skills and by assigning, um, you know, the slower order content, we're really de diminishing their value. So, um, so you see, I, I see too much of the same stuff, but in reality, the principle behind game-based learning, the true principle is not there. Teaching is all about creating a need without the learners being aware of it. And this is sort of where we need to be really clever. And this is why games can be so smart. Um, games use this to get people hooked, but nobody except the teachers can then help people really understand what they are really getting from the games. So what we do is build a need that will cause the people to want to learn. And we can piggyback on games which, we, which have already um, built that need, which already possess that need. Okay, And then we go to the third step, and that is um, of, may, uh, of making use of our roles as teachers to identify that need, identify the skills the students will get from playing it, and merge it with the needs that, the, uh, that accompany what we teach. So I want to use some of the, um, I think um, this was all, these were also mentioned throughout the project upskills, right? Um, the research data management adventure and the data horror escape room, okay? Um, let's say I have a group of young researchers, okay, postgrad students who I have enlisted to help out with managing some research work we are doing. Now, I can either try to have them um, sit down and answer their questions. I can try to answer their queries using emails. Um, I can let them find their own solutions. I tell them, okay, this is your problem, find your solution. Or, for example, I can ask them to take some time and play this game, okay? Um, there are two such games. Okay, so for example, this game here, um, the research data management adventure game. Um, as I said, if I were to give an example that I want to help students with some research um, data management, okay, some research data management skills, but, you know, I... I I, I don't want to do a PowerPoint presentation. I want them to come up with their own ideas, with their own solutions. So um, I ask them to play this game. So let's say, for example, um, let's let's see how it works out. First, first few things, okay? So first of all, something which is also attractive for students, such as um, um, from from the past survey, such as language and linguistics students. And this is why I said we have to know the audience. We know that our students favor this kind of narrative, okay? Something again, which is narrative rich which has which can engage through a story okay so i know that this game here look it's giving us a, a bit of a storyline here okay so you are about to embark on an adventure and blah blah and you are taking the role of a staff researcher which could also be you know a postgrad student so you want to go into qualitative research and when i was you know studying qualitative research there was a certain way you come into lectures you, you sit down and you don't really get ever i'm not saying that this is going to cover all aspects of qualitative research, but there may be skills that, you know, what might be lacking in the classroom, such games can actually make up for it. So would you like a quick introduction? I'll, I'll, sk I'll skip this part, I'll start straight away. And now I ask you to tell me what you want to do, because this game is kind of a branched game, okay? So you take your own choices. So um, there are five entry points, okay? So let's select a link to begin your adventure. Where do you think we should start? Applying for funding, starting work, organizing some data files, describing some data sets, or publishing our work? Where do you think we should start from? One, two, three, four, five. We start from three. Okay, let's start from three. Okay, so here, so here we come. So we come to this part. So more meetings come and go. Soon enough, the research assistants are doing their thing and gathering all that wonderful data. So we skip to the part of the data. Things seem to be ticking along nicely. And one of them pipes up with a question in the middle of a progress meeting. 
So what do you want us to do with the data we're gathering? Do you want us to email it to you or something? Now, this is a good question. OK, so we've got our young postgrads. Um, there is a question. What should we do with the data? Um, yeah, and you have no option here. You have to think about it and get back to them. So once you've logged out some quiet time for yourself, you give the matter, matter full consideration. You begin by brainstorming what you could use as your primary data storage and thinking about the pros and cons of each medium. You reject the less appealing options, and then you've got these five things that you can choose. And please know that here your score is zero. You're still unranked, but you, you're progressing, sort of. Okay, so I ask you now, so would you store your data on a university network drive? Would you store it on a research group server under your desk? A personal cloud storage, USB sticks, external hard drive. Would you select or reject this? The university network drive, what would you say? You select this, okay. Now, if it's, and it goes on, okay. So this is the sort of thing that goes on. Now this is, this is, um, a game that is not like the one that we've seen or, or a game that is not, does not involve action in itself. But, you know, once you get into it, you want to understand a little, you start understanding a bit more of what you need to do because the way you're taking decisions is going to affect the game and the game will take you back to certain instances that you don't want to go back to and all of a sudden you start thinking and and you know what happens here is that you're living through a cer some certain experiences this game makes you live through certain experiences and once you start living through these experiences you start when you see them in real life and you start associating that you know maybe you know uh, if it's on the university network drive you know there's a team of people on site who look after it so next time something like this happens, you will consider finding you know the university network dive drive and using it so you know this is this is one example it goes on and it has various options of course once you play it and complete it all you're not going to play it again but hopefully by the time this was done so this is a game you play like a kind of one-off to get introduced or to introduce your students to this to this to this subject of research data management and after they've played it you can you know understand what they have gained from it and how you can use what they have gained in your study unit in the rest of your lectures maybe through the work or the tasks that you assign to them so this is not just you know saying okay there is this one game which you have to use or which you can use what i'm saying is there are a whole lot of games and that if you are implementing game-based learning then you really need to play a lot of games to search for a lot of games to see a lot of games to be able to see sorry yes 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 the good excuse to keep playing to spend your hours at the office you know playing games for scientific purposes so, so this is another one, for example, this is the data. Again, it's about data. It's an escape room. It's made up of puzzles. So whereas the other one was kind of more storyline oriented, this is kind of different. There's still a, a storyline in it. Um, but um, the storyline is that you've got you've got this urgent message from a professor that and there's an old office and it's Thursday, you want to go home, but you know you want to collaborate and you reach the door. And then you can have an option. Okay, you try the door, or instead of entering the room, you decide to read the posters hanging on the wall. But let's say you try the door. Okay, and this is the door, you push against the door, you try to open the door. Okay, the door is locked, so you have to really, you know, um, take a look around the professor's office. So this is the professor's office. This is a kind of a, of a word um, kind of escape room. And you get a series of puzzles, you as a student. Um, sometimes this game would be ideal to work in groups um, because, you know, like in an escape room, you really need to find solutions to it. So you're looking at the, at the desk, it's surprisingly empty. There's a computer and an address book. You open the address book, for example, and you find this bunch of data here, okay? And you have to click on the, um, the, the data that, would, that, that are found on the address book. So which of the data in the address book are personal data? So the name, the address, no? the phone number, the email address, 
um, yeah, there's the blood type as well, the eye color, the age, um, maybe the age, no, the, the IP address. So, and then you click next and you go on to the, to the, to the next, to the next issue. So let's see. Okay. Let's, let's click on something and see what, what it tells us. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, they're all personal data. So let's click next and see. Okay, so um, so this is this is an example of one of one such thing. So um, studies with personal data. So last year five studies were collected. Okay, um, put the studies in chronological order. You are given the following cues. So as you can see, it's a very simple Google form integrated into a game. Okay, and it's made up of puzzles which people can solve. Now if they're working together, and you have this study unit that is dealing with and about data, you know, again, it won't target all the content that you're meant to cover in your 13 week lesson plan okay in your entire course but there can be elements that would facilitate the understanding the deeper understanding about data um, that you would require from your students or you think your students should know so again so so this is um th this is an example of a game that is not as maybe as sophisticated as you know first person action shooter games or third person action shooter games but again it depends on your audience and what sort of skill set you want your audience to be equipped with so um what i what i would like to add to this is that and this is very important um in essence as a take home thought to ponder okay games have the potential to be awesome tutors doesn't mean that they're teachers or they're educators it means that it, and it also does not mean that every lecture every course every concept we explore with our students can be found in games there are things which games will not address but there are others and i believe that we should exploit these others um, it doesn't mean that we can create a game for every lecture we have we have to identify what games can deliver in the broader sense. And this is why sometimes making use of off the shelf games that people play for entertainment can be a really clever way of making use of them. Um, but how about how, how do we do this? Um, if we take as an example, there's a, also an example in the guide. It's called Black Haven. It is a very simple game. I, I sort of um, chose it in the guide because it does fit in many of the criteria which students coming from a language and linguistics background tend to favor. It is again story rich, it has an element of history which can make it intriguing. It is not too complex and yet not too easy. And you know, I, when I played this game, I said, what can this game deliver aside from two to three hours of trying to solve mysteries? Um, so how might I integrate a game such as this? Um, first of all, the, the skills that such a game like this one, like Black Haven, um, targets, again, include problem solving as well as modes of interaction. So different ways of interacting with different people. Therefore, I might be teaching a study on it, which they will need certain aspects of problem solving or narrowing down and identifying problems and potential solutions through their thought processes. I would sort of first of all attempt to play this game myself as i told you okay um now this is important you cannot use game-based learning if you do not play games this is this is it it's it, it it could be you know it is kind of a, a rhetoric but i've come across people teachers who are using games and they've never played games uh, how can you do that how, how can you think that it's going to be successful if you don't do that so you really need to get down and play games different games you don't need to play educational games, you play, you know, any games, because that makes you understand what it is like to be a gamer, what sort of skills you need to be a gamer. Um, so you cannot use game based learning if you do not play games yourself, find a challenge with you, which you come across in the game, isolate it and start by giving them a small similar challenge in class observe how they manage to solve it maybe you have a class who prefers to reach solutions together or as you have a class that prefer to work um, in, individually uh, on the basis of this you can ask them to either play in groups of two or maybe outside lecture hours to start during lecture time and move on beyond lecture time um, do not tell them what they need to do or to learn 
And as a person who practices game-based learning, what you do is observe them over a few days, okay? The benefits of game-based learning doesn't happen within 40 minutes or 45 minutes. The benefits are reaped slowly over time because this is what gamers do. They don't play once, they play over a period of time. And the greater, the more complex skills, okay, they need that take more and more time. You have play gamers who play incredible number of hours a week to be able to master a skill to be able to play a game properly okay when we say pokemon okay and the chart they don't learn it like in 10 minutes okay it takes them many hours of gameplay but they don't know they're learning it that's the thing so um and then of course once you observe them over a, over a few days um you try to understand what they're saying. Do they suggest other such games? Do they dislike the game? Um, if yes, why? Try to understand why do they like the game? What is making the game so difficult? Is it something about the game mechanics? Or is it something about the solutions to the puzzles which they cannot reach if there is difficulty? And this in itself is great feedback to really understand how they approach this way of problem solving. Um, knowing if there is a problem is a Get great way towards working towards a solution. Please know that we're always thinking in terms of problem because that's sort of the background I come from, right? But there could be other, other, other issues. Um, and then after they have played, you create discussions. I believe that in game-based learning, without okay, if there is game-based learning, there cannot be. Um, discussions. There cannot be um, briefings. We use pre-game briefings, post-game briefings. Playing a, a game without these briefings um, means nothing. We have briefings even when they're um, games such as LARP games, like live action role-playing games. They're great, okay? And basically the idea is to use these discussions to guide the people where you want to lead them. You as a leader, you as an educator. You see, this is what I mean. In game-based learning, the educator carries a very important role, very important. It's not like, oh, there's a game, go play it. Okay, it's not that. You as the leader, you have to really take on this road of guiding, directing your students towards getting the best out of the game they are playing. So you create discussion, possibly involving the whole class into how they reached certain solutions. So what challenges did they come across? Um, how the diversity into the thought processes help them overcome these challenges? And you are not only getting them to talk, but you're also getting them to express themselves in front of a team of people to talk about real challenges and how they, uh, how they met these challenges and how they managed or not to overcome them. If you hear a bunch of gamers talk, okay, even young gamers, okay, like my son and his friends, that's all they talk about, the challenges and how they overcame them and how, what one did and what the other did. And imagine they do that for the real challenges in your study units, okay, wouldn't that be great? And, you know, so this is one way of, how, of using games and how games can be used um, to aid learning. So, um, yeah, just to finish off in the last few minutes, we have five minutes. I have another um, Slido. So now you can scan this and, and let's discuss, let's start, um, you know, even, even your questions, you can put them over here and let's discuss any thoughts or ideas that have emerged while listening to this presentation. Sort of like um, if you were to write something that, you know, about any particular idea that you have had while listening to this presentation, um, what would you what would you write? And you, you can also take this opportunity to ask questions here as well, um, so that um, we can have questions through Slido as well. Yes, I think yes, I think if you want to be real and realistic, Okay, um, it's much better to go for a gamified environment, for example, if the teacher is not really a gamer. Okay, if a teacher is not willing to play a number of games, because then yes, it becomes too time consuming. Maybe I'm just being very too, too harsh about it because people say, oh, this is so cool and everybody should do game based learning. But this is my honest opinion. You have to be into games to try and implement game based learning. You have to be part of the, you have to speak the language, you know, um, if you don't speak the same language, then how can you do it? 
Okay, so this is, and how does the time spent playing games count in terms of ECTSs? And this is the sort of thing I do not subscribe to, see? Um, when it comes to um, games and gameplay, it's very personalized. So you can't really, I believe you can't really quantify. You can have an example. You can say, okay, that game takes about two to three hours of playing. But then again, how, what sort of value are you going to assign to playing that game? Maybe you have acquired some, you know, we, we, we saw the research data management game. Maybe you can say, okay, you got some skills in research data management, but can you really go back to the um, solidicity structure and say, okay, once you play this, you're going to, you know, have three ECTSs. I, 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 I think that quantifying such a thing, especially if it is a complex game, can be a bit, dif a bit dangerous. Okay, so maybe um, the quantification aspect here is a bit of a gray area. Again, depends on the on the unit that you're teaching, depends on the game that you're using, depends on the audience that you have in front of you, depends on the mode of playing that you ask your, your students to play in, maybe group activity, um, in lectures, outside lectures. So this is more than quantifying the value obtained from games is a way of saying, okay, there's an added value to what I'm teaching by using using a game. I would put it that way. What if you cannot find a game that fits your course objectives, then you don't use a game. You don't use a game just for the sake of saying, oh, this is cool because we have game-based learning. Everything has to have a need. Everything has to have a purpose. This is the same like saying, let's do VR because, you know, the metaverse is so cool and VR is the new thing to have and the new thing to do. No, not everything lends itself to VR. Not everything has to go to the metaverse, you know, there are things that would work spectacularly well, you know, if using a VR, but there are things that would be a great big failure. They would just be a kind of a novelty. Oh, this is so cool. And that's it. They would finish there and there nobody would use them. And the audience needs to be engaged in games too. Yep, I think so. But I also think that well-designed games tend to grow on an audience. I'll, I'll give you this example. When I did my PhD, I think, okay. When I did my PhD, I, I created a game for pre-service teachers. I had about 120 pre-service teachers, so, te so people who are studying to become teachers. And basically, I created a 3D um, game inside a 3D world. So everything was done, you know, by me. And the first time I met my pre-service teachers was in person. And I said, this is the first and the last time we're going to meet. And from now on, all our 13 weeks together are going to be inside a 3D world. And you will be avatars. And, and you will have loads of games over there. And of course, teachers um, being, you know, teachers. Now, this is way back, okay, in 2010, 2011. They hated the idea. They spent the first three weeks battling, fighting against being inside the world. They didn't want to be there. I had other lecturers call me saying, what are you doing? And the scope was because, you know, there is an issue with teachers and the use of technology. We know research has shown us that there's a degree of, um, there's a greater probability that teachers do not accept technology as much as maybe other people from industry. They're very slow on actually taking up technology practices in class. Okay, again, this was research way back. Now things have changed. The pandemic has changed certain aspects and certain outlooks, but back then it was very so what I wanted to do was immerse them inside the technology, help them create digital resources and technology-driven practices inside the world. So they were living inside the technology. They weren't just using it, okay, or adopting it. Anyway, three weeks, it was a nightmare. And I thought, oh, this is such a failure. How am I going to stay for 13 weeks? And then on the fourth week, some, something happened, like a kind of a miracle. Of all of a sudden, okay, these hundred. 30 they found a kind of a purpose to it and suddenly they were like wow this is really cool I can do this I can play and I'm enjoying it by the sixth week I have some of them call me to add their husbands 
to the virtual world because their husbands were traveling and, you know, they wanted to meet them on the virtual world. I said, no. I said, this is, you know, our world. Of course, it's persistent. It goes throughout the night and so on. But no, I mean, we, this is us. And so, like, it went from total rejection to acceptance. And by the 13th week, they were so comfortable inside there that they didn't want it to stop. They said, let's continue this. I can use it. You know, I can use it. To, to teach, I can use it to do things, to do things and to do stuff, to play with my, they would love it. And so, you know, yes, the audience has to be engaged, but sometimes they need a bit of a help. They need a bit of a guidance, maybe working together helps in this case. And once they get the knack of it, if again, it is a well-designed game, I think that, you know, um, maybe certain opinion and there have an open mind, I think that certain um, opinions can change. Um, would you have any other questions that you'd like to, there's, uh, there's something in the chat maybe? Just a personal experience, yep, from Christina. I discovered after introducing some crosswords and simple games on the Moodle platform I use in a Japanese language course for beginners, I found out that students mostly used only the compulsory part of the Moodle activities. And the same students clearly enjoyed simple games in class. Maybe they needed in-person interaction after so much online learning during the pandemic. And absolutely, I do not think that games, you know, are the um, panacea of everything. Um, they, they don't solve all the problems in the world, okay? Um, there are, uh, I keep repeating this, there are ga certain, some games that lend themselves particularly well to certain, you know, to, um, discussing certain concepts, but there are others that that um, do not. So we can't expect games to, you know, provide an all round solution for us. Right. So thank you for having us, us here. Um, Margarita over there <laughs> is the uh, my, my partner in this in this enterprise. And we're just going to to explain or, you know, kind of give you a, a, a short overview of what we did in, in, the, in the, uh, the framework of game and, ga and, and creating a game um, related to um, theory-based learning. Just a quick roadmap, just to let you know what we're going to do. First of all, I'll just give you a few words about what we, th what we think theory-based learning is and why. Um, and then we'll develop the idea of, of the game which would enhance theory-based learning and will show you the upskilled version of that and will give you a few tips on how to use, if possible, if you need, you need to use or if you want to use the game or part of the game, okay? Uh, most, most of the curricula that we have will introduce, well, in linguistics at least, you know, we are we're much more focusing on theoretical linguistics in our university, for example, will introduce, you know, give introductions to theory, to a theories or whatever, depending on how you view things, one or several theories. And um, in many contexts, the question is, what is a theory? Well, a theory is considered as, first of all, a means to approach a topic. You have a topic and you present it from one perspective, giving you, you know, access to the, the topic with respect to the theory, uh, but also a means to provide building blocks, which will enable the students to apply uh, some kind of analysis tools to some of the facts that that are there out in the world and you using one theory or another will help you to analyze uh, data that's the main goal of theoretical approaches not just for the fun of the theory itself but also to try to use it for different um, data and in our case linguistic data mostly for example generative grammar in Geneva is taught first of all because it's a descriptive approach to syntax it gives you gives you, you know an idea of what um, uh, sentence structure is about, but it's also taught as a tool which can be used, and that's what we also expect our students to be able to do, to analyze specific linguistic data. Okay, so that's the kind of theoretical approach that we have as a background to what we do. But actually the acquisition of a theory, which can be developed through a theory-oriented teaching, does much more than that. And that's the difficult one, it's kind of the, the, the hidden part. And um, for example, we know, or we have come up, come up with the, with the, the, con the uh, observation that to think in theoretical terms will mean also 
learn or discover, discuss a problem, and especially uh, in its kind of dimension in which you abstract away from individual instantiations and come to generalizations. Uh, you can think of uh, the in theoretical terms because you build up a framework or choose the best framework in which you have a specific problem that can be solved. Of course, you learn precisely to generalize over individual cases. Um, you are also able to view a given problem from different perspectives. That is, you have to go outside, you know, have take a perspective, a look at, at the phenomenon outside the phenomenon itself. And of course, you are encouraged to propose different kinds of solutions, predictions on what new instances of a phenomenon will look like. So have some kind of general skills that are not just linguistic skills, but skills that are more general skills. And guess what? This is precisely the kind of skills that employers look for. And this, if, you, if you look at the, the, the needs analysis, this is typically the kind of thing that, um, that um, the industry is looking for. So thinking in terms of theory is not just you know, something that's internal to universities or to the academia. It's actually an activity that develops many other skills. So the question is how to integrate theory-based teaching uh, into a system which, which would also develop these skills, kind of actively encourage students to develop these skills. There are all, lots of different things that can be done. So learning activities which make the students reflect on the task they're given. That's an important point. I've encouraged people to think about what they are doing, not just that they're doing it. Design learning activities so, uh, which familiarize the student with theoretical cont contents, obviously but also maybe make a link with occupational, with the occupation's typical activities. So, you know, if you are going into, if you're interested in something like um, machine learning or, or something like that, maybe try to think about how, what, what this would mean exactly. Define learning out outcomes that connect the educational process and the needs of the job market. That's precisely what Upskills is trying to do. And also, making the teaching material engaging by using gamification or game-based learning. And this is exactly what we were, we tried to do. So um, in the autumn of 2021, Marguerite and I um, decided to teach a course on language variation. And in that course on language variation, that's a, a classical MA class in linguistics, okay, in the, uh, in the University of Geneva, we decided that we would give our students a, a challenge, that is develop a game with two constraints. Constraint number one, it would need to integrate theoretical linguistics because that's also part of our mandate to teach them ling uh, theoretical linguistics, but also again, that also could be re reused for teaching purposes. So they had to have in mind the fact that this game was, would, be, would, would be interesting to integrate into other pieces of teaching. Maybe they would be able to go and teach that at some point or another. Um, as a starting point, we... Uh, we base our game on uh, something that Margarita suggested, which was actually, a, I think, a, a, a long kind of a wish from a long time ago, which was to uh, go back to well-known game that you probably all know, guess who? And those of you who do not guess, guess who I know it, I would encourage you to discover it. It's a great game. Um, it's a fun game, but like many fun games, when you kind of look at what's going on, there's lots of things going on actually when you do, when you, when, even when, when younger, younger children or young, young, you know, younger people play the game. Why? Why, why is it interesting as a game? Um, because it builds on the idea that you have these individuals, you all know that you have to guess who the other person's, uh, uh, who, who, whose character, you know, is hidden behind the, other, the mystery card of the other person. Um, and it's all, all, all um, taken in terms of features, that is characteristics, binary features, that is, are they supposed to be binary in the sense that you, because you're only allowed to ask yes, no questions, you have to think of a binary way of dealing with that. And these features, uh, the set of characters can have different kinds of features. They have all more than one feature. There are actually you know, have several. And we observe that some of these features can be very superficial, like wearing a hat. One day you wear a hat, another day you don't. Or you can have much more kind of deeper intrinsic features, like, for example, having blue eyes. Okay, you can't change that. Well, nowadays you can, but normally you, you're not expected to change the color of your eyes because that's part of your DNA. That's part of your, 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 your deep person. 
Okay. Um, very interestingly, um, we found um, among the very the very vast literature on on, on the net and elsewhere um, about this game. Uh, including strategies on how to win the game and all kinds of other things, we found this wonderful table which lists all the characteristics of each of the character and precisely having these yes, no kind of things, which very clearly shows the binary system. Okay, And it ends up giving you a table in which actually each of the characters, you look at the different characters, have, has a different profile. That is, is a set of different features. So each individual ends up being characterized by a unique set of features, which can be of different kinds, of different levels, deep, deeper kind of features, superficial features, et cetera. And I guess that I, now you immediately see the relation with language and language variation, because that's exactly what we, what we tried to do. That is transposing that to languages. So we start with the theoretical assumptions because you need to have some kind of theoretical assumptions to transpose the game. And that's what we did with our students. That is, languages will vary with a limited range of possibilities. You don't have extraterrestrial languages around the world, okay? And by hypothesis, and this is part of the theoretical assumptions, the range of variation is limited to the possibilities of the human mind. So this is why you cannot learn a language that's not a human language. And of course, there are many dimensions to the language, that is syntactic variation, morphological features, phonological features, and others prosodic features that we kind of also listed to some extent, okay? Which ends up giving us the you know, the kind of background knowledge that each language of the world is actually a collection of features which have a certain value, okay? And this is what we, we in, in the theoretical um, framework in which we're working, we call parameterization, okay? So we introduced to the students to this kind of background of theoretical assumptions with which we were going to work. Then there was a conception phase, okay? And the difficult part of the conception phase is how to compose a coherent language board okay with in which you would need to identify the features so we asked you the students to list the, to come up with a certain number of possible features very difficult task i mean more difficult than what we think generate binary options i'll come back later to an example of where you have to make choices to find the, the binary option kind of system and of course find evidence to assign the value plus minus of the binary yes no to um, to each of the features of the languages Okay, um, the, the main data source was the WORLDS, the World Atlas of Language Structures. Sometimes when we didn't have the data, students were encouraged to go and check with native speakers if they could have kind of comp complement the data. But just to be on the safe side, our, our main source was WORLDS, which is an adjusted, uh, you know, kind of wonderful map of atlas of, of a typological atlas of languages of the world. And what they came up with is this which actually reminds us of the previous table, but this time for languages, where you see the list of languages that they chose. We eliminated duplicates, for example, Italian and Spanish were very similar, so we didn't use both and other things like that. And we eliminated one or two languages for, for which they did not have the data. And they also, we also encouraged them to choose a certain number of features. And then we, again, we discussed with them, we already discussed the fact that some features maybe were less practical. It's not that it's impossible. I guess in theory, all features would be fine, but we discussed these features and the colors correspond to different levels of different kinds of features go corresponding to the hats versus eyes type of information, like deeper uh, st structural uh, properties like uh, SVO or WH fronting and surfacey kind of uh, information like lexical information and other other stuff or, and, and morphological features in between. Um, so so they they produce this idea of having a binary system for languages. Okay, then the realization of the prototype was the next challenge um, because the, the question is how do we adapt the game to non-visual features? Okay. So very easy with eyes and with hats, less easy with WH fronting or with lexical features. And uh, the idea was to create a didactic tool, that is add a glossary, a table, and of course do all this with, while preserving the gaming experience similar to the original one. That is the, 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 the excitement of having to guess your opponent's language before he or she guesses yours. And the students being extremely creative came up with this prototype 
that they, they had, you know, there's a lab which helped them to create actually the, the, the cards with the features and the board and it's and everything. Okay, so that was, if you want, the, the, the end of the first part. Uh, the second part was how can we reuse this? Because this, this is a one shot thing. You do it once, fine, that's done. Now, the next question is how can we reuse this? The first step was then to think of something that would be shared by everybody. And the sharing by everybody is the realization of an e-version. That is something that would be accessible anywhere in the world, which again came up with new challenges. And this was not our students. This was a group of, of students in the, in, the, in, the, in the computer science uh, section of the Faculty of Letters who, um, you know, they, they developed small pro projects and we had two wonderful students who developed this project for us. And again, the challenge was again to adapt the visuals to a screen display. We had these beautiful cards and now we have to think about a screen and integrate the didactic tools, that is add a gl the glossary, the table. And again, this time, imagine a fluid and interactive gaming experience. That is, you know, you would have to go to, through, you know, all the different steps while preserving the essence of the original game that is the keeping the uh, the, the 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 stimulus of having to, to guess as quickly as possible the language of the opponent the opponent in our case is the computer for the time being the only the version we have is a, is a version on which, in which the student plays against or the, the player plays against a, a computer we might think of developing an, a, a kind of more complex version later on um, this is how it looks like but I'm going to go through um, a bit more in, in more detail about how how exactly it looks because this is this is just a kind of you know image of this. So uh, I'm going to share the screen with you. That's the that's the first page. This is where you have the the welcome guest the language online version. Ah, oh, that's the thing that's that whistles maybe. Um, here you have the, the 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 entrance page and you have the instructions here. So if I click on instructions, I hope yes that works. So you have a little explanation of what the game is supposed to be about, um, and um, mm -hmm. yeah okay. And once you 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 read, you read this, okay. So this is where you have the game material and the game material is composed of a glossary that the students created that is giving an explanation for each of the features with examples of positive versus negative values for each one of them. So, you know, just hand, arm, 20, politeness, grammatical gender, whether does your language have grammatical gender or not. And we also have the famous table of the feature list, which is here, it's a different color, but it's the same thing, which lists all the features for each of the languages, enable us to check that each language has a unique set of features in our, in our, in our game. Okay. And um, this is what, this is how the, the game looks like in the end. That is, you have, it's, the display is not optimal for some, some, my, my screen is not adapted to the display here. But the thing is that each time you play, the computer draws an, an, uh, um, a random card, which is going to be your card, and draws a random card, which is going to be the computer's card. And of course, the whole story is to try to get to guess the, uh, the computer's card before the computer guesses yours. Okay, so I have Hungarian. What a coincidence. <laughs> and, um, and then the computer asks you a question. Does, the, does the, your language use the word derived from cha? And then you, you have a look at that and you see it's not in, among, among your features. So you say no. Okay. And then you can, cho you can choose a question and there's a drop uh, uh, here, uh, drop down where, for example, things like that. So the, one of these, the, where the students decide to have one killer uh, question, uh, does your language have tones? There's only two languages which have tones in our system. So if you say yes, if you're very happy, if you're very lucky, uh, the, no, the computer says no no tone so you 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 um uh where are they um chinese so you hide your chinese card because chinese has tones and your language does not have a tone etc etc i'm not going to play the whole game with you but just to show you how it works and um ultimately the game ends up being having this kind of you know um step by step process until you if you're lucky, or the computer, if the computer's lucky, guesses the game. It's absolutely, the way it's done, it's random. The, the computer uh, chooses random questions. So it's not, a, it's not an artificial intelligence. So, so from that perspective, you have a chance. You, know, you can win pretty easily. You can outwin the, the computer very easily. 
Okay. Um, final thing, how can we reuse the game? That was our purpose. Okay. We have a few suggestions on how we can integrate the game into your um, activities, into your teaching activities. One of them, for example, is just simple breaking the ice with the guessing, guess the language game. So first class, very easy introduction so that people have an idea of what a language variation is about and play the game. Alternatively, there's more for most sophisticated reflections on languages, for example. So what would be the equivalent, the linguistic equivalent of a hat? That is what are the superficial features that a language has, which can be easily removed or changed as opposed to what is the linguistic equivalent of having blue eyes, for example, word order, an SOV or an SVO languages are structurally very different. Um, we also encourage, for example, activities around getting students to add a new language to the game. What does it mean? You have to think of a new language, identify the features that are there for that language using, for example, walls or other means of, you know, other sources, and then add the language to the game. Okay. Um, similarly, get the students to add a new feature to the game. So again, identify a new feature, learn, how, learn to make a theoretically motivated choice for that feature and check the value for all languages. And this is where, for example, there might be a problem because, for example, the, what I mean by theoretically motivated choice, if you look at the, at, at, on walls, at the, 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 the distribution of object, subject, uh, verb, uh, across languages, you notice that there are more than two orders. So how do you go about having a binary system in this case? And this is something that the students were encouraged to think about. And for example, they came up with the idea, is your language SVO? And if not, well, it's all the others. So I'm basically isolating SVO languages and non-SVO languages. It's one theoretical choice among others. So it's not the only one, it's a possibility, but it also enables students to make decisions on some kind, sometimes difficult questions for which they will need to uh, solve the problem. Okay, so just to make it short, the, the skills that guess the language can help develop in general, collect linguistic data, Organize, annotate data, confront data with a theory or an analysis, compare different analysis, different approaches, interact minimally with programming because in some of the, one of the activities that is adding a language, uh, the, the, the game can be downloaded and then the, um, the students can locally change the language, retrieve, add their language and of course, eliminate another one so they have the same number of languages. So they can interact minimally with programming um, and of course, elaborate research uh, uh, report on, the, on their research activities, which is also thinking about what they've been doing and how they did it. But I think that more generally, uh, guess the language like other activities can help identify a problem, break it down into sub questions, design a protocol to solve a problem, steps, timing, how do you do that? Share the task within a team, that was a very difficult thing to do, that is to decide who is going to do what. Evaluate solutions and outputs and present outcomes in different forms to different audiences. And I'm just on a personal note, I have two daughters who work in completely different fields, but these are the skills that both of them need every day in completely unrelated fields. So this is, this, these skills are, are important skills to develop in any kind of domain. So what's behind Guess the Language? It's different approaches to teaching, modularity, working with unfamiliar new data, hands-on, goal-oriented work. We have to keep quality standards, replicate the gaming experience. We work on transferable skills or they, students can work on transferable skills encourages creativity, but most of all, it enables students and teachers actually to think outside the box and come up with their own solutions. And that's, I think, is a crucial skill that we kind of, we've been aiming at. Now, because you've been so nice, all of you and so kind and so kind of just nodding gently whenever and being patient because I was losing pages. We have, oh, sorry, before that we have the, this is just the conception team and the, that is all the students that helped us do that, both in the conception and digitalization. But we have a little gift for you. So please prepare your phones 
and there you are. You can download the game. It's not playable on on mobile phones, okay? Simply, simply because the display, you see the display is not, it's not, not adapted to mobile phones. We would love to have a mobile version one day, but for the time being, it's not this one. But you know, you can retrieve the link and then um, download it onto the, to your computer and play and and play around with it, use it. You know, we we just we have no we are, we're not we're not selfish on this, okay? Why be selfish on other things, but not on this? So there you are. So thank you very much. Uh, right now we're going to be like for the final last but definitely not least we're going to be presenting. I'm going to be presenting what I think is the biggest in terms of uh, size output of uh, uh, of upskills of the gamification of the educational games aspect of upskills and it's a game we've called Top Lang. Uh, in order to keep in line with, you know, this is a game, so we, we don't need a really serious name, but it, it comes with an explanation that it is basically a simulation experience. So I wouldn't call it, I mean, it is a game and you, I think you all appreciate it as a game, but basically what we're trying to do with this is to simulate something. And I'm going to be, you know, I'm going to be justifying first what... Uh, how how it came into conception and then how it was developed um, and what it contains and apparently you know how how we're going to be helping you use it as well uh, so let me just start by okay um so what we've learned i mean we've we've heard about all the intellectual outputs of, of upskills and whatnot um one of the things that I felt like you know it, it was something that I that that, that we led the focus interviews uh, we led at the University of Malta with uh, job market stakeholders and as part of these these uh, focus interviews that gave uh, feedback to like that they were fed into um, uh, the um, uh, intellectual output one profile description and whatnot uh, we. Uh, we did not if we did uh, note notice a particular pattern and this pattern is basically that um, uh, companies generally and we're talking about industry here because you know as we said uh, we're the, the the main um, focus of upskills is skills and employability uh, companies have a general preference for employees who are in possession of a higher education of an of an HE degree of a higher education degree and the main reason for this is not because they are really superb at what they're doing but because they are bound to be more receptive to further training so no company actually I don't think any company said we're we're looking for someone who actually has the skill set that we're looking for they said we're looking for someone who has a specific skill set and we will be able to train into doing the particular role that we wanted to to, to fulfill and uh, uh, generally uh, the biggest drawback that, that the employers uh, that we interviewed uh, found in, in this whole process is that um, graduates are prepared for tasks like they know how to conduct research they know how to write a proposal they know to, you know they know how to do stuff that are linked to higher education but they're not really very well prepared for the sort of tasks that we'll have to carry out when they enter a company's workforce um, and sometimes these tasks they don't even see the relevance you know uh, when they enter the workforce uh, and I think that one of the important thing to distinguish here is the distinction is, is a very important distinction between what an academic career is aimed at and what an industry career sort of aims at on the whole. And I think that we can all agree as academics or students or whatnot, that whenever someone goes in an academic path, uh, and I'm talking about, you know, starting from an undergraduate, BA, BSc, whatever you have, um, uh, and getting up to a PhD, the whole point is zooming in on areas of research, right? So you start off with a general don't know, BA in linguistics, then you decide that you want to focus on syntax, and by the time you're a PhD, um, uh, you have a PhD degree, you sort of have a really, really, really robust specialization in a very specific topic area within syntax, like pro drop or whatever have you, right, on that subject. So it seems that the focus is placed on achieving a thorough understanding of a single particular topic of a, or area of research, and I think that this is perfectly fine because we're talking about fundamental research here. However, when we're talking about higher education and employability and, and industry, especially the language-based industry, I think that uh, what is the requirement is a specialization, but also an understanding of procedures and workflows so uh, one of the things that we don't really touch on 
in our learning content, which uh, which is you know discipline related or transversal skill related and whatnot, um, is an appreciation of what actually does it mean to be in the business, right? What does it mean to work for an office? What does it mean to be assigned the task and work with the team and whatnot? Uh, and uh, basically, the focus uh, there, I think, and you know, we have industry experts as well who can confirm or otherwise, the focus is placed not so much on thought or understanding of things, but on versatility and adaptability, on the extent to which the ability to handle a variety of tasks and think outside the box by having a particular skill set that is necessary for your job. So nobody's going to tell you you're going to be annotating for the rest of your career, like for the next 20 years, every day you're going to be annotating. You're going to be communicating with clients, annotating, doing X, Y, Z, and whatnot. Um, so what we tried, what when we conceived of the game of Toplang, what we tried to basically include in, in this whole upskills agenda was the extent to which, you know, we can give our students or whoever is involved with the materials of upskills a glimpse of what it means to work uh, at the industry, right? Because they're not really familiar with that. And our intention is, I mean, okay, and, and basically we've already talked about games and whatnot. And, and the idea here is, can we really address something like this through a game? And I think that, you know, you already, like I think Vanessa's uh, presentation also pointed to this, but, and, and the reason why I'm quoting this, and this is from back in 1968, so it's really old stuff. But the idea is that simulation games can serve many functions. And the most important one to education is that they present the student player with a real life situation, allowing them to use their knowledge and abilities while discovering decision making skills for themselves. Uh, it's back in the day, that's why we have the he and him and all that stuff. So I think that when we're talking about real life situations, it's definitely relevant to the upskills goals because it, this relates to the work uh, space environment, um, uh, to the workplace the, and, and, and what we're seeking as in terms of employability. Uh, when we're talking about using knowledge and abilities, the idea here is not to just learn, it's basically to use what you've already learned or what you're about to learn in order to solve a problem, to, 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 to you know, to, to solve the puzzle or whatever have you. So I think that this is generally a simulation game would be very conducive to active and task-based learning by the very definition, like you get to do stuff rather than, you know, uh, get served things. Um, and um, discovering decision-making skills for themselves, building of confidence. And I think that this is the most important thing, at least from the, uh, from the needs analysis report, that that you know that was underlined as 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 lacking the most like you know all graduates of a language or linguistic degree they're very very you know well skilled in specific things but then i don't think that if if they go into an interview and they tell them okay now you need to talk to a client they're going to be like yeah i know how to do that like they're going to be really scared for that so um the main aim of the game is is basically this to familiarize with the workplace to familiarize with particular workflows the the, the players with a particular work for, uh, workflows and whatnot and and why why would we use a game for this i think that um by creating this game we are trying also like this is again part of the needs analysis it's a different um you know subtask within that led to the creation of the needs analysis but when we're on the survey of business sectors that hire linguists and language graduates the attributes that they, the businesses themselves uh, feel are most in need of improvement of our graduates of linguistics and language related degrees are, you know, problem solving, technical skills, organization skills, communication skills, analytical skills, creativity, attention to detail, and working under pressure. And I think that with the game, we can actually really take a problem solving approach to, 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 to you know, to immerse in students in, in a set of tasks. And by doing this in a gamified way specifically, I think that we help, we help them indirectly develop analytical skills because we're not telling them now you need to think about this. They just need to pass the level. They need to, you know, to, to get forward in the game. We are definitely enhancing their creativity by giving them, you know, a more fun and, and thing. And, and we can also test how they would work under pressure because if you give them repeated tasks, to do, and they know that they have like they have to answer to the client or, or or whatever have you, you know, you can also they can also get a better feel of a real life, because nowadays in academia basically you have to give an assignment to the students at least eight weeks in advance. They can ask for an extension for another three weeks. I don't think that goes for industry, right? I mean, they they need to do something and they need to get the answer now. It's not it's not like that. 
So the conception of Toplang, and now I'm going into the specific game and I'm going to showcase it to you. Uh, the inspiration was directly drawn and actually in the beginning we were planning on using a, a game that was developed back in 2020 um, uh, at the University of Zurich, uh, which was called Lives in Transit. Uh, and this was an interactive text-based game which simulates the experience of researching and writing global history. Obviously our aims are completely different from global history and researching and whatnot, but I think that the interactive text-based um, mentality or rationale behind this suits our purposes really well. So given the focus of upskills, as we've said, is enhancing employability problem, prospects. So why not use this recipe, which we all figured was successful, you know, when, when, when playing Lives in Transit. Uh, uh, our game's aim is to link the student experience to real life work tasks that have to do with linguistic data. So we're training linguists, translators, language related graduates and whatnot. And we wanted to give them exposure to a task that they might be asked to do within a working environment. And uh, um, since, again, the target audience consists of higher education students, the starting point for our game is the actual graduation. Like you graduate and then what? And obviously, we we need to give it a twist in order to make it interesting, because otherwise we're we'll just you know having fun during the summer and then looking for a job for six or eight months. This is linked to getting an internship in a research and development company that specializes in language. We've called it LangX. It doesn't really matter, but the idea is that the moment you graduate, you sort of get the news about that. Uh, and this is the interface. I'm going to talk about the interface uh, towards the end. So basically, this is your level one. Every level starts with a nice picture and whatnot so that it's immersive and, and I'll explain things a bit more. Uh, you can click on play level and basically you get this nice interface where you can put pictures. You, sometimes you can put sound as well and whatever have you uh, and get the story going. So you made it following months of hard work. You're about to graduate with your bachelor's degree. It was challenging at times but the feeling you now have makes it all worth it. Sure, you now have to think about your next step, but this can wait until after a couple of days of celebration. For now, you've planned it all. You're going to party, you know, the, the works. And then, uh, so you enter the ceremony with a big smile on your face. And then basically the ceremony is coming to an end. You're bored to death, but wait, your head of the department is heading towards the podium and she wants to make an announcement. She wants to make an announcement now that doesn't seem right. Better be important while you're thinking about the poses you're going to have for the graduation photo shoot and whatnot. And then you get this nice audio file, which you can't hear because it's not. So, I mean, if you have audio problems, we've also got a transcript here. So I would like to congratulate you on your achievement. We've teamed up with Langex Limited, the multinational giant that specializes in linguistic analysis. And they were, they were trying to, you know, to get people to work for them. So we've uh, negotiated with them six internships. So you can all apply and I'll send you details tomorrow and, and whatnot, right? And this is actually also in audio format so that it becomes a bit more immersive. And then obviously the story keeps going and going and going and going and things happen and whatnot. So, and, and then you can actually respond to this by having a positive or a negative attitude. Like, you know, you you join your peers in cheering. It's unbelievable. You might be able to start your career or you just can't wait for the ceremony to be over. You're, you're going to have time to figure it out later on. Now it's time to party. You don't want to care about this. Obviously the story brings you back to the point where you want to do it because otherwise the game would be, uh, you know, would not, would not work. So the idea is uh, we start off this storyline. This is actually quite long in the sense that I think that the original storyline would take at least 25 to 30 minutes for someone to, uh, to get. And, and, you know, this, the, the aim of this is basically to ensure the immersion. Because it's, if, I mean, it's very easy to tell someone, okay, I'm going to give you a gamified version of an exercise. But I think as Vanessa established, it, it has to do with planting a seed. And I think that this is the most like interesting comment, you know, I've, I've heard with relation to, to, to game-based learning. So ensuring immersion, okay, the first level is uh, the graduation took place. You need to, you, you, you either, you're really excited and you want to apply and can't wait for the email and you go party and whatnot. Uh, so there are slides about you dancing with your friends and talking and whatever. Um, and then uh, there is also the other choice you can make that you don't really want to apply, but you want to just get going with your life but then suddenly you get a message that the pay for this is insane and you have to do it for the money because other you know it would be stupid not to then the second level has to do with you deciding whether um, um, yes the second level has to do with you actually applying uh, and waiting in order to get the appointment 
There's another level, job interview preparation for the job interview, talking to your peers, being there anxious, waiting for the interview. Uh, and then uh, in level four, basically you're getting the news, but there is a nice big dilemma you have to answer, which is basically whether you're going to be working uh, on language analysis, so more, pure, more, more theoretical aspects, but still digital analysis of language, or NLP, AI stuff. Um, and the idea here is that basically, uh, uh, and, and there is a reason why we have these, these like two paths that sort of uh, inter um, um, yeah, that, 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 that lead you to, dif to do different parts. Uh, one important thing, and I think because, you know, this is part of upskills and we wanted to basically also, uh, showcase our data and whatnot, uh, what we've included in, ah, yeah, an added value, obviously to all this. And, it, and the reason why this is ensures immersion is that basically you introduce the main story characters. So basically you have key players who will be with you to, uh, until the end of the, of the game. And, and also you can establish a behavior pattern for the character of the player. So they are either very positive about doing things or they're very negative and grumpy and whatnot. And uh, another thing that we've implemented is in level two, basically while you're trying to apply for the, um, uh, for the job, you see that there is a learn more uh, thing. And then you click on the button and uh, the internships uh, are on the basis of four different roles that you can play uh, in the company. And here we recite the upskills, needs analysis, like profiles and whatnot very briefly. So as to sort of, you know, pat ourselves on the back for coming up with those as well. Uh, so you decide to just click on the roles and, that's, and go through them and whatnot. So uh, then the next part, uh, starts off with uh, one or two levels, depending on the path, uh, that is supposed to be strengthening the immersion, but also introducing like the work aspect to it. So it's not just fun and getting the job and whatnot, but basically you get accustomed to, you know, you have a daily briefing meeting, you're allocated tasks to the team, you need to do collaborative work. It's not just you doing things, but you know, someone assigns you to some team and you have to work with someone and whatnot. Uh, and then obviously we introduce a few more characters like the manager, the mentor, your colleagues and whatever have you. Um, and I think that the main, you know, the, the main aspect of this is not just, you know, cause, cause I mean, there is a lot of fun storyline, you know, around the tasks and I'll reach the tasks, obviously, um, you know, the, the whole point is, you know, to familiarize the players also with the, re the realities of being on the job. Like you might, you might be in a meeting and you might be asked who wants to do this. You need to volunteer for that. Right. Uh, or you, you can be assigned to a task that you don't have a choice, or even you can get, get assigned to a task that you don't want to do, but you have to do because your boss tells you that you have to do it or whatnot. Uh, um, and obviously, you know, getting feedback on your work within the scenario and whatever have you. So when you do a task, someone tells you this was good, this wasn't good or whatever have you. Obviously, because this is a game and we, you know, want to encourage people, um, feedback is, the scenario is made in a way that, you know, feedback ends up being positive. So even if you do a mistake, you know, someone comes in and tells you, no, that shouldn't be like this and you can correct it or whatever have you. So, um, the aim, the reason why we've distinguished between the two paths, language analysis path, which is basically analyzing language using digital tools. I think that's the main aim here, uh, or preparing data for linguistic analysis using digital tools or whatnot. And the, um, uh, and the NLP path uh, is basically because they have different roles to play in the whole experience. So if someone chooses the language analysis path, they can see how learning can actually be gamified within the context of a work simulation environment. Uh, so basically, when you choose the language analysis path, the player gets tasks to complete in line with the internship role and can check their class notes in order to complete them. So basically, the idea is that we introduce the learning materials or parts of the learning materials, we introduce the whole thing uh, as an add-on to the actual tasks that you have to do. So in order, uh, basically we give the player a choice. You always have to give the player a choice because otherwise you're forcing them to look at the materials and that's not really a good choice, I think. So basically this, you know, this is a very random, like who would have thought, uh, like um, uh, a food technology company wanting some work by a linguist, right? And, uh, and then you understand there is a description of what the actual task is. And then basically you have to make a choice. You're very confident that this is something you can easily handle, which is basically classifying texts on the basis of their genre. Uh, 
Uh, so you go and grab a cup of coffee waiting for Hans. That's the collaborator that you're working with who's going to send you the data to get in touch. Uh, and then, okay, again, to be a bit more you know, optimistic, this shouldn't be too hard to do, but you think you'd better be safe than sorry because this is your first task or whatnot. So you decide to go back to your class notes and see if you can spot anything that would help. Um, that has to do with corpus creation and creating a golden star of the corpus and whatever have you. Uh, so yes, you, you find it. There is another question about, okay, where should I look? Should they look at the programming? Should they look at corpus, uh, like processing corpora? Or which, which study units should I look at? And then you have another choice. Oh, you have a link to the materials that from back in the day. And okay, it has different examples, but the whole the point is so you can it can help you refresh your memory. So you click on the, on the file in order to see it, or you just don't look at the materials. And basically, once you click on the file, you get a slide set with, with which is again developed on H5P, so it has immersed exercises and whatnot. So you get ten slides that gives you the basis about designing and building corpora, and on this basis you can actually solve the task. Uh, that, that has been assigned uh, to you. But again, you can have a choice not to use it or use it depending on your preferences. Then, uh, uh, an alternative way of doing this, because you can just have the same scenario, an alternative way of doing this is that, okay, this has to do with statistical analysis. You're given some graphs and they're pretty straightforward, but just to be sure you decide to keep your class notes to the side, you can also get the task. And alongside the task, you get this button here, which can provide you some information about what is a stacked bar plot or, or whatever have you. So basically this way, someone is doing the task. And as you see, these are quite simple tasks, but the whole point is to, you know, to, 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 to give a proof of concept, right? Um, and then if you need help because you don't understand what this is, you get a bit of advice, right? So this is the basic rationale. I mean, I'm going to tell you how the sort of the, the, the scenario sort of concludes uh, in a bit, but uh, this is the rationale for the language analysis path. And this actually has many more tasks than, than the NLP path. The NLP path is quite simpler because it has only three sort of like steps to it. Uh, but basically the NLP path is there to showcase how you can gamify assessment and uh, include it in a simulation type of, 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 of scenario. So the idea here is that when you have the NLP path, it involves a bit more of role playing because we actually implemented videos for this. The player gets a problem and the player has to solve the problem by bringing in disciplinary knowledge. But in order to make this a bit more, you know, fun and interactive and feel the urgency of that, okay, I'm going to get some real action finally. So what's this about? They give you information about the task. Yes, certainly you're going to help out. Then you realize that your friend has con that your colleague has connection issues during the meeting. I mean, there need you need to build a story and whatnot. Uh, and then you have a video conference call with your mentor who has the connection problems and the client. So the idea here, and I'll give you the recap just so we don't waste time on this. So it's basically this is Loneke, who is playing Hannah de Reuter, the company rep, and uh, she wants something to be done. And she doesn't know how to do it. And she asks your mentor for help. And your mentor is saying, yeah, we can fix it, I think. And then the connection is cut off. And she's like, oh, where did she go and whatnot? So you have to give the answer yourself. Uh, and basically, this is, again, in the form of a quiz. So uh, this is, again, in the form of a quiz. And, and what we haven't seen, but I will share, uh, you know, the link is going to be up there in like five, five to 10 days. So what we've seen is that we can have a work simulation quiz, which is actually in this case, you know, it's embedded in a video. So it, you, you get the sense of the urgency. I mean, it's as real as it can get, I guess. Um, what we've implemented in the game is that you have increasing levels of complexity because at the same time, you need to make sure that as, as Vanessa actually said, you know, someone cannot start by the doing the most difficult thing. You need to start off with easy questions and then make things a bit more complex. Uh, and then basically, uh, you get feedback when the wrong answer is provided. And I'm going to show you when I'm discussing the technical details of the feedback and whatnot, how this looks like. Uh, so basically, you don't only assess, but you know, you can also strengthen the learning. So the idea is that there are ways in which you can see what the original answer was, but then through the game, the, the, the students led to the, to the correct answer. So you can both assess them, but they can also learn why what they said was a mistake, right? Why, why what they chose was a mistake. Uh, and basically, 
the whole point of, of gamifying assessment this way that is that it motivates you. So basically, you know, when you provide the correct answer, you, everybody's really surprised and really happy with you that you thought outside the box and whatnot. So you get further motivation to keep going, right? Uh, and basically the whole point of this is that you're applying disciplinary knowledge to real life problems. Because I mean, all the scenario we have in the, all the tasks or the questions that we have in the NLP path, are based on, I have a company, there's a lot of spam. I have a company, I need to make a QA and a section, you know, things like that. Uh, and then basically the final bit, so we have the two, uh, the two directions. One is the linguistic direction, the other is the NLP direction. And obviously you need to have a final bit where you get the resolution of some sort. Like and when you play a game, you need to have an end result. And uh, the game resolution here is that um, you complete a number of tasks. So it's three in the one hand, it's, eight or nine on the other uh and basically you get familiarized with what you would be doing in a normal job within a num number of weeks like a couple of weeks or 10 days or depending on on the scenario you pick uh, and then uh, there are safeguards to correct mistakes so that you know you're not completely useless when playing the game even though you you know your first answers can be registered uh, you can create a path to success so basically the idea is that you create a path to success and the resolution is that your manager comes to you and says, okay, you've done a really fantastic job. I want you to apply for a permanent post with us, uh, which has just opened and whatnot. And you decide to apply or not apply. Again, you're given a choice. And if you choose to pursue this, they are asked to write a motivation paragraph about what you've learned on the job. And actually when they apply, it, like th there is the same, the exact same task is there when they're applying for the internship where they have to describe what they know from their education and then what they've learned from playing the game. So I think this is some sort of indirect feedback that we can also use uh, as a result. Okay, so this is what the game is about. I, I hope that it's transparent enough and, and, and you know, and, and, and easy to understand. And now the fun, if that was the fun is over. How do I do this? This is the most important question. Uh, and uh, in order to answer this, maybe you don't know of this platform maybe you do i mean it, it's it's a it's an open source framework based on javascript it's called h5p uh it's actually free open source which means that everybody can use it uh and uh, basically this is what we used for this uh it gives you the ability to create a multitude of interactive content types so it's not just what we've done here but you can actually create interactive books whatever have you uh uh, in our case, what we used is a particular type of scenario, a particular type of case use of, of H5P, which is called branching scenario. And this is important because it has limitations, not just all fun and roses and, 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 and whatnot. So uh, using the branching scenario, the important thing about this is that you don't need to have specialized software for users to access it. You actually, it works directly in the browser which means that there is cross-platform compatibility no matter what someone is using. And also it's mobile friendly, which is fantastic. So you can use it across the board. There is direct integration with most learning management systems and even simple websites. So you can actually implement it wherever you like, no matter if you do use Moodle, not use Moodle or, or whatever have you. So it's very easily deployable. And there is a what you see is what you get editor, which I think is the most important thing because, you know, I'm not a programmer myself. So and having to develop this was not the easiest of things. There is a learning curve, but at least you don't have to code. And uh, just to give you a bit of an idea, this is sort of the interface. This is from their website. It looks so basically you create the story. It's slide by slide. Then you put uh, a question. Uh, then each question can lead you to a different path in the story and whatnot. Uh, uh, this is, I think, the, a beautified version because this is one eighth or tenth of the game, of our game. So it gets really complex and long and, and, and difficult to handle. That's why we broke it up into levels. But the idea here is that you work on this by using what I would call a slide, basically. So this is the backend. So basically you get this empty presentation slide, and then you can just include the image, the title, the narrative, and also you can include audio, which can be uh, triggered the moment you click, the, the slide opens up. So I think, you know, as far as immersion is concerned, there's not much more that you can do with, with free solutions or open accent solutions, right? Uh, then 
uh, you get, uh, so this is the basic storyline sort of setup. And as you saw in the example I gave you, then you get like these crossroads where you have to pick a choice to, to choose a path or, or whatever have you. This is what is called a branching question. And basically the nice thing about this is that you can give the alternatives, people can choose whatever they like, but at the same time, you can also provide feedback if they choose a specific thing and you want them to choose something else. And this is how it sort of pops up. So, you know, this is about sparse word embeddings and whatnot uh, in, in, in one of the NLP tasks. And this is the feedback. So close, but there's a better solution. So maybe think about it, go back, check and, and whatnot. Uh, so th there is a separate slide for this. It's just there wasn't space here. So basically it comes up as a pop-up. And then when you click on next, you go back and you have to select a different option or rewatch re the video or whatever have you. Okay. I think that's the main point here. So keep calm and play games. How do I do this? Do not panic. I know that this sounds a bit, I, and I was a bit overwhelmed at the beginning, but it's actually very, very simple to do. And the most important thing is that we're preparing the manual that will guide you through the process of adapting the game. And I think that it's not about the process of adapting the game. I think that the most important aspect of this is to convince you to perhaps create your own game. Uh, and why create your own version? Because obviously, you know, Top Lang is, is developed as a standalone game. Its actual purpose, however, I think for me at least as a developer, you know, is, is quite different. So on the one hand, the obvious uh, purpose is to disseminate the upskills rationale ever further and, and, and user materials and whatnot. But uh, for me, the real one is, that, is to basically showcase that game-based learning does not need to be like super expensive, super complex and whatnot. It can be cost effective. It can be easy to implement. It can be very, very versatile depending on what you want to do through it. So you don't need to hire a game designer in order to develop a game, right? You can actually do it quite easily. And I think that it's all about planting a seed and, and what we want to achieve, what I, I would personally love to achieve with Toplang is basically planting a seed for people to think a bit outside the box and create their own storylines or whatever have you that are related to their own courses. The rest is mainly uh, on the basis of creativity.